Spiritual Awakening, Volume 2 of the Spiritual Councils of St. Paisios of Mount Athos, is published by the Holy Monastery Evangelist John the Theologian, Surati, Thessaloniki, Greece, English Edition, 2008. Prologue. The Blessed Elder Paisios began speaking to us about the difficult years ahead as early as 1980. He often said that we too might experience many of the events described in the book of Revelation. His purpose, of course, was to instill in us a positive concern. Footnote, positive or good concern is the good restlessness and anguish for the good struggle. The person struggles, observes himself, recognizes what obstructs his spiritual progress, expresses concern, asks for help, and does spiritual work. To continue, instill in us a positive concern so that we may intensify our spiritual struggle, resist the spirit of indifference, which he had seen slipping treacherously even into the ranks of monasticism, overcome self-love and combat our weaknesses in order to strengthen our prayer. Our weaknesses, he used to say, weaken our prayer, and we can neither help ourselves nor the people we pray for. Wireless communications become useless, and if the wireless is down, we will be defeated by the enemy. Footnote, throughout his councils, the elder made frequent references to wireless communications, meaning, of course, our contact with God through prayer. He was fond of this metaphor, having served during his youth as a wireless operator in the Greek army. To continue... The overall prologue of the first volume, entitled With Pain and Love for Contemporary Man, features a comprehensive account of the origin, selection, and compila compilation of the material contained in the series, The Spiritual Councils of the Elder Paisios of Marathos. In this present volume two of the series, entitled Spiritual Awakening, we have included themes concerning the present-day reality. These themes call upon us to be in constant vigilance and readiness, preparing us for the difficult situations that we may confront one day. We have already realized what the elder often noted, quote, we will go through storm after storm. This is how it will be for some years to come, an overall state of turmoil everywhere. The second volume consists of five parts. The first part refers to the sense of indifference and irresponsibility prevailing in our time and to the compelling duty of conscientious Christians to ease the situation through self-correction, prudent behavior, confession of faith, and prayer. At one point, the elder noted, I am not saying that we should take up banners and march in demonstrations, but that we should raise our hands toward God in prayer. In the second part, the elder kindles the zeal for spiritual work without confining us to a particular struggle. It is then up to each person to take up the struggle according to his own strength and philotimo and to live the life in Christ, which is paradise on earth. Footnote on philotimo, according to Elder Paisios, is the reverent distillation of goodness, the love shown by humble people from which every trace of self has been filtered out. Their hearts are full of gratitude toward God and their fellow men. And out of spiritual sensitivity and a sense of honor, they try to repay the slightest good which others do for them. To continue, the third part refers to the short occupation period of Satan, which will give Christians the opportunity to witness to Christ again, as in holy baptism, but conscientiously this time to struggle against evil and to rejoice in advance for the victory of Christ over Satan. The elder used to say that the saints would have envied this opportunity of ours. Many saints would have wanted to live in our time in order to take up the struggle earnestly, but it is now up to us, and we are unworthy, at least we should recognize our unworthiness. Effectively confronting the present situation requires the cultivation of a heroic spirit, as well as the spirit of selfless sacrifice. In the fourth part, which addresses divine providence, faith, trust in God, and divine assistance, 
we are guided toward the source from which we can draw the strength to confront any adver adversity. Lastly, the fifth part focuses on the need for and the power of heartfelt prayer, a mighty weapon in combating the ever-increasing evil around us. The monks and nuns are called upon to be in an unceasing state of alert, much like soldiers in time of war, constantly helping the people with prayer and carefully preventing the distortion of the spirit of monasticism, and thus leaving a leaven for future generations. This last part concludes with a chapter that defines the most profound meaning of life, while reiterating the need for matanya, for a change of direction, a change of mind, that is, repentance. In this volume, and as always, the counsels and the activities of Elder Paisos are weighed in the scales of discernment. In these texts, one may see the elder deeply immersed in prayer, even as pilgrims knocked at his cell, ringing the brass bell hanging outside his wire fence and shouting impatiently and persistently, Yeranda, stop praying for a minute. God will not be offended. At other times, he will abandon the desert and go out into the world, as otherwise his absence from some common activity could be misunderstood and harm the church. Or we may see him overcome by righteous indignation in reaction to someone's blasphemies, while at other times he will remain silent and simply pray for the blasphemer. Given this, the reader should not rush to conclusions until all the chapters have been carefully studied. Above all, the reader should not isolate any of the counsels of the elder and take them out of context, for this can lead to erroneous conclusions. The reader must always keep in mind that the elder is speaking about a particular event or a specific question and is responding to a specific person, the salvation of whose soul is in the balance. Those who knew the elder remember the gentle consolation his words brought to their hearts, no matter how harsh his counsels may have been sometimes. The reason was that the elder always aimed at healing the evil, not at stigmatizing it. He wanted to deliver the soul of, of his counselee, not expose the passion to public ridicule. These very same words, when used outside this context of pain and love, may be easily misconstrued and perhaps prove to be untherapeutic. Instead of delivering divine consolation and security to our hearts, his words may arouse doubt and fear, or may even lead one to extremes, when in fact the elder was neither a man of extremes nor one-sided. He wanted to see good done, but properly, for people's benefit. Of course, he never hesitated to speak the truth, yet the truth was spoken with discernment. He would be overcome by righteous indignation at the desecration of anything sacred and would even announce the formidable events that were, that were to take place. But his demeanor never caused fear and agitation in others. On the contrary, he conveyed the hope and the joy of the resurrection, a joy that stems from the selfless sacrifice that relates one to Christ. And as long as one is related to Christ, by participating in the sacramental life of the church, and observing his commandments, one has nothing to fear, neither devils nor tortures. In his characteristically graceful manner, the elder said at one point, when you set yourself aside, Christ is by your side. Christ, after all, is the very one we seek in all of our spiritual life. And this is where he points out a danger a Christian often encounters. If he does not cultivate the spirit of sacrifice, he cannot become a communicant in the life of Christ and remains with a mere external formality without an inner life. The frequent references to the personal life of the elder may trouble some readers, particularly when he seems to relate rather easily, easily certain divine experiences of his. However, in putting the spoken word into writing, it was not possible to convey the difficulty with which the elder spoke about himself nor the pressure exerted in order to convince him to share some of these personal experiences. In fact, sometimes a certain event was related in installments to various nuns and with different details. And when the opportunity arose, we attempted very hesitantly to extract any additional information that would complete the narrative. 
Thus, in the course of 28 years, during which the elder spiritually guided our sisterhood, he revealed for our benefit a few of the divine events in his life, which proved to be for us a spiritual blood transfusion. This is why he was greatly saddened when the spiritual progress, which he expected, was not achieved. He would sometimes say with pain, I am spreading fertilizer on sand. We thank those who reviewed these texts prior to publication and expressed their respectful thoughts on the counsels of the elder, and who also encouraged us to press on with this effort, since, as they told us, the counsels of the elder are directed to all the members of the church. May the counsels in the volume Spiritual Awakening, through the prayers of the blessed St. Paisios the Hagurite, who, as many do ascertain and confess, is always watching over us, and who secures us with divine love, instill in our hearts a good concern, so that we may struggle with Philotimo, so that evil will retreat, and the peace of God will prevail upon earth. Amen. The Dormition of the Theotokos, 1999. Signed the Eurondis of the Holy Hezekasterion Mother Philothei, and the Sisters with me in Christ. An introduction to the elders' councils. Yerunda, how do you see things going? How do you see things going? What can we say, Yerunda? You tell us. The present calm worries me. Something is up. We haven't quite understood what times we're living in, and we don't even consider that we will die someday. I don't know what will happen. The situation is very difficult. The world's fate is in the hands of a few, but God is still holding the brakes. We need to do a lot of praying with pain and love for God to intervene. We need to take matters seriously and live spiritually. These are very difficult times. Much ash and trash has fallen. There is great indifference. A very strong wind is needed to blow them away. The old timers used to say that the time will come when people will start kicking. All barriers are discarded and nothing is respected. It's terrible. Everything has become Babylon. We must pray for people to come out of this Babylonian captivity. Read the prayer of the three young men. Footnote, the prayer of Azariah and the hymn of the three young men is an addition to the book of Daniel, inserted between chapter 3, verse 23 and chapter 3, verse 24, and found in the Greek Septuagint version of the Old Testament. Read the prayer of the three young men to see how humbly they prayed. Read Psalm 83. O God, who will be compared to thee? Be not silent, neither be still, O God. We have to do this, otherwise we struggle in vain. We need divine intervention. Now, certain European sicknesses have come into the mix and they keep getting worse. A Cypriot family man who lived in England once told me, We are in spiritual danger. I must take my family away from England. Over there you can see a father taking his daughter, a mother her son. Everyone is crowned in marriage. Everyone is blessed. I am ashamed to even mention some of the things that are going on, but we don't lose any sleep over it. Now, I'm not saying that we ought to take up banners and go marching in protest, but we should turn our attention to the great danger ahead of us and raise our hands to God in prayer. We must defend ourselves against evil. We must put on the brakes because it seems some are trying to demolish everything. This is the time to repeat the verses from the psalm, Make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb, yea, all their princes like Zeba and Zalmuna, who said, Let us take to ourselves in possession the pastures of God. Psalm 82, verses 12 to 13 from Septuagint. To continue, There is great confusion. Everything is in a whirl, making people dizzy. People are like bees. If you strike the beehive, the bees will swarm in frenzy. They'll start buzzing around, and then what they do depends on the wind. If it's a north wind, they'll go back into the beehive. If it's a south wind, they'll fly away. It's the same with people. 
They're constantly buffeted by a national north wind or a national south wind. And they're dizzy. Even so, in spite of all the turmoil, I do feel a sense of consolation, a certain sureness. The olive tree may have dried up, but it will sprout new shoots in time. There are some Christians upon whom God relies. There are still people of God, people of prayer. And the benevolent God endures us and will provide again. These people of prayer give us hope. Do not be afraid. As a nation, we have survived many tempests and we were not lost. We shouldn't be scared of a brewing storm. We shall weather this too. God loves us. Man holds within him a hidden power for times of need. The difficult years will be few. They'll only be a passing storm. Now, I'm not saying these things to scare you. I just want you to know where we stand. For us, it's a great opportunity to celebrate the hardship, bear witness to our faith. Be with Christ, abide by his commandments, and pray to have divine powers in order to face any hardship. Forsake sinful passions, and divine grace will come. Something that will greatly help is to have a good concern. Where are we? What are we going to encounter so that we take the proper measures and are prepared? Our life needs to become more temperate. We need to live more spiritually. We need to love one another more. We need to help the suffering, the poor, with love, with compassion, with kindness. We need to pray that they'll all turn out to be good people. God will provide the solution. Our benevolent God will provide in the best possible way, but we need to be very patient and careful. You see, often when people are impatient in unraveling a spool of thread, they only manage to tangle it even more. God disentangles patiently. Things won't be like this for long. God will sweep it all away. Around 1830, when a large contingent of the Turkish army was on the holy mountain, for a period of time there were no monks in the monastery of Ivaron. All the fathers had left, some with the holy relics, others to help in the Greek revolution. Only one monk would come from afar to the monastery to light the vigil oil lamps and sweep. As the Turkish troops were both inside and outside the monastery, this poor monk would sweep and say, my Panagia, what is going to happen with this situation? One day as he was praying to Panagia with pain in his heart, he saw a woman approaching. It was the Panagia, shining and with a radiant face. She took the broom from his hands and said to him, Give me the broom. You don't know how to sweep well. I will sweep. She swept the floor and then disappeared into the sanctuary. All the Turks were gone in three days. Panagia had sent them away. God will throw out whatever is not right, just as the eye gets rid of a foreign body. Satan may be working, but God is working, too, and he will turn evil into good. Take broken tiles. God can take them and turn them into a beautiful mosaic. So don't worry. God is above everything and everyone, governing all things, and will call on each of us to give account for our actions, and we will each receive our just reward. Those who aided others will be rewarded, and those who caused harm will be punished. Ultimately, God will order things aright, but each one of us will have to account for what he did during these difficult years with our prayers and kindnesses. Faith is under attack today. The stones of faith are being removed one by one to bring down the edifice. But we're all responsible for this destruction, not just those who remove the stones and destroy the building, but also those of us who sit back and watch the building fall and do nothing to shore it up. Whoever pushes someone toward evil will be held accountable to God. But our neighbor will also be held accountable for seeing this evil done to a fellow human being and for doing nothing about it. People will easily believe someone has the gift of who has the gift of persuasion. People yet under like wild beasts. I have no complaints against wild beasts. You see, animals cannot do much harm as they lack the ability to think, whereas a man who wanders far from God becomes 
worse than the wildest beast. He can do so much damage. The strongest vinegar is made from spoiled wine. The other artificial vinegars are not as strong. The worst of all is when the devil forms an alliance with a perverse human being. That's when he can do twice as much harm. Just like carnal thoughts, when they ally themselves with the flesh, they do the greatest harm to the flesh. For the devil to work with such a person, he must be of some importance. He too must have evil intentions and be evil himself. Then, God forbid, these people will cause great harm. They'll threaten others, harm monasteries. The church and monasticism will be a threat to them because they'll upset their plans. The present situation can only be confronted spiritually, not in a worldly manner. The storm will worsen, discarding more trash and junk, but then everything will be sorted out. That's when you'll see some receiving their fair share and others paying their debt. Things will work out in such a way that no one will be complaining over the misfortunes they will experience. But, needless to say, neither will they be saying, Glory be to you, O God. Oh, how God truly loves us. The things that are going on now. These words were spoken in June of 1985. And the things people are planning on doing, if they had occurred 20 years earlier, when people had greater spiritual ignorance, the situation would have been far worse. Now people are more aware. The church has become stronger. God loves people. They're his creation, and he will provide for all their needs as long as they believe and observe his commandments. Cursed is the man who does the work of the Lord with slackness. Jeremiah 31.10 from the Septuagint. To continue, in the old days, if a believer worried about the state of the world, he was thought not to be right in the head and was destined for confinement in the tower. A tall defensive structure built into the monasteries of the holy mountain and used to ward off pirates. Today it's just the opposite. A believer is destined for confinement in the tower if he's not concerned for and doesn't feel pain over the prevailing conditions in the world. You see, in the old days, those who governed the world had God in them, whereas today many of those who govern have no faith at all. Nowadays, many of them are trying to destroy everything, the family, youth, the church. Today, when one is concerned over the condition of our nation, then that's a confession of faith in itself, because the state is opposing the divine law. It's legislating laws that are contrary to the law of God. There are also some who are completely indifferent. They don't believe in the church and they don't recognize the nation either. To have their peace of mind, they say, St. Paul himself teaches that one should not be concerned about the affairs of the world. And they just don't care. But that's not what St. Paul meant. During his time, the pagan nations were in power. Some people severed their ties from the state and turned to Christ since they had become soldiers of Christ at a time when the whole world was pagan, St. Paul's message was, don't get involved in affairs of the state, 2 Timothy 2.4. However, when St. Constantine the Great came to power and Christianity prevailed, the great Christian tradition was gradually established throughout the churches, the holy monasteries, and through art, the rule of faith and worship, and so on. As such, we have a responsibility to maintain all of these traditions and not allow the enemies of the church to abolish them. I even heard spiritual fathers advising their spiritual children, don't get involved in affairs of the state. Now, if they had attained such a high level of sanctity through prayer that they didn't care about anything worldly, then I would be the first to kiss their feet. But they're only indifferent. They don't want to rock the boat. Indifference is unacceptable even among worldly people, even less so among spiritual people. An honorable spiritual person should do nothing indifferently. The prophet Jeremiah exhorts us by saying, Cursed is he who does the work of the Lord with slackness. Let us give spiritual comfort to the people. 
In the old days, six out of ten people were truly God-fearing, two somewhat so and the other two indifferent, but even they still had some faith in them. Today it's not like that. I don't know where all this is going, but I do know that we must now try to help people spiritually with all our might, just like in the old days during the great flood with Noah's Ark. We must now try to save some from being spiritually maimed. This has to be done with great care. It will take a lot of discernment to see things from many points of view and try to comfort people spiritually. Do you think it's of any comfort to me to have so many people coming to my door or that I want to see so many people? No, I don't. But under these conditions, these poor people need a little help. The reason I didn't become an ordained priest was so that I wouldn't have to deal with people. But now I'm far more involved with them. Yet God knows my disposition and gives me far more now than he would have if I were only to do what suited me. Often I have asked Panagia to provide for me a far away and peaceful place where I wouldn't see or hear anything, where I could pray for the whole world. But she won't listen. But when I pray for insignificant things, Panagia does listen to my prayer. I realize that now when I am about to have to see a lot of people, God nails me down with an illness so I can get some rest. He doesn't give me that sweetness of prayer I used to have in the past because if he did, I wouldn't be able to pull myself away. When I had it, it was very difficult for me to pull myself out of that spiritual condition when someone came to my hut, to my cell. Kalivi. Footnote, the elder, following an intense spiritual experience of his love for God and man, felt himself melting like a candle in a warm place. He then realized that he could not refuse his help to others. From then on, he devoted the daytime to the people who came to visit him, while at nighttime he was devoted in prayer for the various problems of the world. However, when the number of the faithful who came to visit him increased dramatically, he thought of retiring to unknown places where he could devote all his time to prayer. Then, for a second time, he received the call to remain in his kelion dedicated to the little Panagia, Panaguda, and to provide spiritual comfort to the people. To continue, there in my cell I became a, a program for the people. As I'm inside reading the Psalter, they're outside knocking on the door. I tell them, in 15 minutes, and they shout, Hey, Father, stop praying for a minute. God won't be offended if you do. That's how far they go. It's not only that I'll interrupt my prayer, but if I can, if I go outside, it's all over. I have to manage to finish all I can before then. By 6.30 in the morning, I have to have finished even my daily vespers in order to manage. So for me, it's like, O morning light of the holy glory. By the time you finish your orthos, I'm already done with the Comboschini of the Vespers. If I get a chance to have some Andideron in the morning, all's well and good. Afterwards, I can't even get a cup of tea. I'm dead, ready to collapse. Even during bright week after Pascha, I had to observe the ninth hour and the three-day rule that is, abstention from food and drink until the ninth hour, 3 p.m. by Byzantine reckoning, or for three days. Whether you can or not, you must do it. One day I don't know what obstacles people faced. Maybe there was a storm at sea and there was no boat, but no one showed up at the cell. Oh my, I had a day like those I used to have on Mount Sinai when I lived in the cave of St. Episteme. The elder lived an ascetic life in the cave of St. Episteme on Mount Sinai during the years 1962 to 1964. So, you see, when the, storm has, when the sea has a storm, I have calm. But when the sea is calm, then I have a storm. I could, of course, go somewhere on retreat. Do you know how many have offered to cover the expenses and send me to California or to Canada? You must come, they say. We have a Hezekasterion there. If I should find myself in an unfamiliar place, it would be 
like I was in paradise. Nobody will know me, and I will have my rule to live as a monk, as I desire. But you see, a soldier is discharged only after the war is over. Now we are at war, in a spiritual war. I must stay at the front lines. There are Marxists, Masons, Satanists, and so many others. There are so many who are possessed by demons, anarchists, suffering from delusions, and they come to me asking me to bless their beliefs. And there are so many sent to me by others without any preparation, some only to get rid of them, and others so that they won't be the ones to pull the chestnuts out of the fire. If you only knew how hard-pressed I am from so many directions. I'm so embittered by others' pain, but I feel consolation in my heart. If I were to go away, I'd see it as a retreat, abandoning the front line. It would be betrayal. That's how I see it. It's not as if I set out to do these things or help the monasteries. I started out for one thing, and now I find myself doing something else. And how must I struggle? And you see, no one else is reacting. Who cares if people are trying to destroy the church? They'll tell you, oh, it doesn't matter. They're like feathers in the wind, so as long as they are comfortable. How can they possibly be comfortable? They'll be made comfortable by Satan in the end. These are not honorable things. If I wanted to do what pleases me, well, you know how easy that would be? But the point is not to do what pleases me, but to do what pleases and brings consolation to others. If I were to think about my own ease and comfort, I could find a myriad of places and ways of doing that. But in order to enter the will of God, you have to be a doer of God's will and not merely a servant of yourself. Part 1. The Responsibility of Love The way the church is love, this differs from the manner of the legalists. The church sees everything with forbearance and seeks to help each person, no matter what he may have done, no matter how sinful he may be. Chapter 1. The Indifferent Generation Indifference to God breeds indifference to everything. What's that noise? It's an airplane, Yeranda. Close the window. We don't want it coming in. The world has gone so mad even that could happen. Everything's falling apart. Family, education, public services. People don't care about anything. They are empty. Whose fault is it that we have come to this? I'm speaking in general terms. I just want to show you how indifferent people are. Go to any school and you'll see. For example, if open windows are banging in the wind, it's doubtful that even one child will care enough to shut them so that they don't break. Some will gape. Some will just sit back and watch them rattle, while others will merely pass by as if nothing is happening. Indifference. An army officer who was in charge of the oil depot used to tell me, I'm having a hard time finding a soldier to place on guard duty at the depot, one who will be responsible enough to keep others from starting a fire or be sure that he himself won't throw a cigarette. There is a half-hearted spirit, no manliness at all. We have completely gone bad. I wonder how God tolerates us. There was such so much dignity in the old days. There was Philotimo, great sacrifice. During the war in 1940 at the frontier, the Italians would sometimes have an encounter with the Greek guards and would visit their guard post. And to see the Philotimo of the Greeks? Once, when the Italians went to a Greek guard post, the Greeks offered them some coffee. One of the Greek officers took a handful of money out of his pocket, 50 and 100 drachma notes. And this money was worth something back then. And he set them on fire in order to boil the coffee. He wanted to show the Italians that Greece was a rich country. The Italians were impressed. See the spirit of sacrifice? Nowadays we have been permeated by a spirit that one finds in communist countries. In Russia, even though they had an abundant crop this year, this was stated in 1990, there will be great hunger among the people. They did not harvest the grain on time. They went to harvest in the autumn. Is harvesting ever done in autumn? 
But if the crop is not their own, how can they ache enough for it to go and harvest? Their life is a drudgery. They don't have the drive to go and create something because for so many years they were not free to create. There it goes with an idle spirit, with this indifference. The whole country is sinking. Is it raining and the wheat is spread out? They don't care. Is it time to leave work? They leave work. The rain washes the harvested wheat away. The next day they will go to work on time to gather what is left of it. But when the wheat is your own and it's spread out on the threshing floor, if it should rain, would you ever leave it to be lost? No. You lose your sleep in order to save it. And even though you're so very tired, you feel joy. You feel delight. Indifference towards God leads to indifference toward everything else. It leads to disin disintegration. Faith in God is so very important. When man worships God, then he loves his parents too, in his home, his relatives, his work, his village, his whole region, his state, his fatherland. One who does not love God or his family isn't capable of loving anything. And of course, he doesn't love his country either, which after all is but one big family. What I'm trying to say is that everything stems from faith in God. When a person does not believe in God, he doesn't care about his family, his village, or his country either. And all of these values are now falling apart. And this is why there is a spirit of indifference and idleness. A police officer wrote to me, I couldn't come because I had a lot of work to do. There's only two of us covering an area that is supposed to be covered by eight. You see what's happening? Instead of assigning two more policemen, they're leaving only two. Fortunately, there are exceptions. Once a father came to me and said, Pray for my, my son, Angulo, because they're going to kill him. I had known his son, who was serving in the military at the time since childhood. Why, what's wrong? I asked him. He said, He found the others playing cards when they should have been on duty. He reprimanded them. They didn't listen. Then he went to report them, and one of them threatened to kill him. Look, I said, they're not going to kill him, so don't worry about that. But I will pray for Angelo so that they do not court-martial him for not playing cards with the others. I learned something else and said, Glory be to God, there are still some Greeks who care about their country. An Air Force pilot had attempted to overtake some Turkish planes who had violated Greek airspace to take pictures in order to prove it. The others from the ground radio communications told them, let them go, don't bother. But he insisted and kept trying to overtake them. In the meantime, the Turkish pilot with the bigger airplane was flying faster and lowered his altitude, leading the poor Greek pilot to fall into the sea. And there are others who simply fly around in their, in their airplane. What a difference. One has to grasp the real meaning, to have a need to do what is good and right. Otherwise, all is idleness and indifference. You can't possibly force someone to go fight in a war. He'll be looking for ways to run rather than fight. But once he understands what harm the enemy can do, then he'll volunteer to go. People today are so self-centered. In the old days in Farasa, my homeland, people used to say, if you have some work that needs doing, don't leave it for tomorrow. If you have some good food, save it for tomorrow when a visitor might come. Nowadays people think, let's leave work for tomorrow when someone might come to help us, and let's eat the good food tonight. Today most people are self-centered. They think only of themselves. Let's say it starts raining very heavily. You'll see that most of you will start thinking of whether you have laundry hanging on the clothesline and will hurry out to pick it up. This is not a bad thing, but our thoughts do not go any further. Even if they get wet, the clothes will dry again. But what about those people threshing their harvest? Do you feel for them, offer them a prayer? Or when lightning strikes, it is doubtful if a handful of people will think of the farmers or those who have greenhouses. People do not think of others. They don't go beyond themselves. Their thoughts constantly revolve around themselves. 
but when they revolve around themselves, they have themselves at the center, not Christ. They function outside the axis which is Christ. In order to be able to think of others, the mind must first be with Christ. Then one can also consider the neighbor, the animals, and all of nature. His radio station is working, and as soon as a message is received, he runs to help. If our mind is not on Christ, the heart is not working, and as such we love neither Christ nor our fellow human beings, not to mention nature, the animals, the trees, the plants. By living this way, you will never reach the point of having communication with the bird, the animals, the birds. If a bird were to fall from the roof, you would feed it. But if it does not fall from the roof, you do not think about feeding it. When I look at the birds, I say to myself, the poor birds need to be fed, and I throw some crumbs. I leave out some water. I see diseased branches on the trees, and I immediately think of cutting them off so the rest of the tree doesn't get infected. Even when a door or a window is banging, that's where my thought goes. I will forget myself if I should not be needing something at that moment and will tend to the door or the window so that they will not be damaged. I might think of myself as an afterthought, and if someone thinks and cares about the other creatures, how much even more must he think and care about their creator? If man does not live like this, how will he ever communicate with God? Even when you simply go out, take a look around. Someone may have carelessly or maliciously, and I do hope no one would do that, thrown something to cause a fire. So take a look around. This too is a spiritual act. For even a glance can bear love. When I come out of my hut, my cell, I take a look downwards and I take a look toward the roof to see if something is burning. Unless, of course, one has such faith that if something does catch fire, prayer alone will put out the fire. Otherwise, one must take action. Also, if I hear an explosion, I pay close attention to see what it is. Is it a gun? Are they practicing? Is it a blasting charge? My mind runs immediately to such concerns, so that I may direct my prayer with the Comboschini. One who disregards himself out of love for others will have the great care of God, and all people will care for him. But today's generation is the generation of indifference. Most people are only for the parades. If something were to happen, don't even try telling them to defend themselves. And nowadays they don't like parades either. In the past, at least, people would go to the parades, listen to a marching tune, and something would stir inside them. Today, we Greeks are idle and lack discipline. Of course, other nations are even worse, without any ideals. You see, the Greeks may have a whole lot of faults and blemishes in their character, but they have one gift from God, philotimo and bravery. They celebrate everything. Other nations do not even have these words in their vocabulary. We have a responsibility. This was related in 1992. An atheist to the bone had come to my hut once. After going on and on, he finally told me, you know, I am an iconoclast. He believed in nothing and yet he claimed to be an iconoclast. So I told him, you godless fellow, how can you talk to me about being an iconoclast when you believe in nothing? At the time of the iconoclastic controversy, footnote, iconoclasts were those Christians who refused to render honor to the holy icons. The iconoclastic controversy had thrust the Byzantine Empire into turmoil for more than a century, from the year 726 to 843. It was re resolved at first by the Seventh Ecumenical Council in 787, which condemned it as heresy. Rekindled by Emperor Leo V, the Armenian, the controversy was finally settled by Patriarch Methodius in 843. To continue, at the time of the iconoclastic controversy, some Christians fell into error through excessive zeal and went to the other extreme. But then the church resolved the issue. It was never a matter of not believing in God. He then went on to support the present situation. And then I really became angry with him. How can the present situation be acceptable to you? I told him. Judges afraid to judge. Indictments against criminals withdrawn because someone or another threatens them. 
Who is running the country? Are you comfortable with this situation? If you support such people, you're a criminal yourself. Why did you come to me? Get out of here. And I sent him away. Yerund, aren't you afraid to speak like that? What is there to be afraid of? I've already dug my grave. If I had not dug my own grave, then I would be concerned about the person who would tire himself digging it. As it is now, someone only has to throw in a few shovelfuls of soil. I have in mind another atheist, a blasphemer, who has said the most blasphemous things about Christ and the Panagia, one who is permitted to appear on television. Even the church does not take a stand to excommunicate some of these people. Such people should be excommunicated, but the church seems reluctant to do so. Yet under what would be accomplished with an excommunication when these people do not believe in anything anyway? It will at least show that the church has taken a stand on the matter. Yananda, is the silence of the church an indication of approval? Yes. Someone wrote some blasphemous things about Panagia and no one spoke up. Then I told someone, Did you see what so-and-so has written? And he told me, Well, what can you do with those people? You'll get soiled if you try to deal with them. They're afraid to speak up. What did he have to fear, Yarunda? that people might write something about him and ridicule him in the press. And so he tolerates blasphemous things about Panagia. We want others to pull the chestnuts out of the fire so that we can have our peace of mind. This indicates a lack of love. Then man begins to act out of self-interest. This is why we see an all too familiar spirit today. Get to know so-and-so because he will then speak well of you. Be on good terms with so-and-so and he will not speak badly of you. And so forth. After all, we must not be taken for fools. We must not become victims. Another person remains indifferent and does not speak up. I do not speak out, he says, so that I won't be written up in the newspapers. In other words, most people are completely indifferent. For a long time, no one would write anything, but now some little effort is being made. Years ago, I had scolded someone on the holy mountain. You are over-patriotic, he retorted. Not too long ago, he came back to find me and say, they have destroyed everything, family, education. And I, in turn, told him, you are over-patriotic. This whole situation has led to one bad thing and one good thing. The bad thing is that indifference has overtaken so many people, people who used to have something in them, but who now just say, who am I to solve the situation? The good thing is that many people who are beginning to be troubled and to change for the better, some even come to me and seek to justify a bad thing they did previously because they're now troubled by it. Yet under, are we then always to confess our faith? Discernment is needed. There are times when we should not speak out, and other times when we should confess our faith with courage, otherwise we will bear a responsibility for not speaking out. During these difficult years, each one of us must do whatever is humanly possible. Whatever is not humanly possible, Leave it to God. This way we will have a clear conscience that we did what we could. If we do not resist these evil things, our ancestors will rise up from their graves against us. They endured so many hardships for the homeland, and what are we doing for it? Greece, Orthodox Christianity, with her sacred tradition, her saints and heroes, is under attack by the Greeks themselves, and we do not speak out. It is a terrible thing. I told someone, why don't you speak out against what so-and-so is saying? And he replied, what can one say? That person is totally depraved. If he is totally depraved, all the more reason to speak out and strike him down. They do nothing. They let him go on with his depravity. I actually spat at one of the politicians in disdain. Say at least that you do not agree. Be forthright. Your attitude is that as long as you're all right, everything else can be ruined. If Christians do not confess their faith, if they do not react, such people will do even worse things. But if they react, then they'll think twice about it. But I suppose many Christians nowadays are not made for battles. The early Christians were tough nuts. They transformed the world. And during the Byzantine period, if even one icon was removed from the churches, the people rose up in protest. 
Here Christ was crucified so that we may be resurrected and we remain indifferent. If the church does not speak up so as to avoid a conflict with the state, if the metropolitans do not speak up in order to be on good terms with everybody, and especially with those who help them and with the church foundations, if the monks of the Holy Mountain do not speak up for fear of losing their subsidies, who's going to speak up? I told one of the abbots, if they threaten to cut off your subsidy, tell them, we will then no longer provide hospitality to the pilgrims, so that they will think twice about that. The professors of theology also do not speak out against these abuses. They reason, we're civil servants. We will lose our salary, and how are we then to live? In the meantime, the monasteries have been caught up with the pensions. Why do you suppose that I do not want to receive even the small pension from the farmer's insurance fund? It is not honorable for a monk to be insured as a farmer. To be insured as an indignant? Yes, I can see that. It honors the monk. But to be insured as a farmer? Why? A monk has disclaimed fat pensions, abandoned the world, and come to the monastery to receive a pension? We betray Christ for a mere pension. Yet is it acceptable for a nun who may have worked as a teacher for some years to receive her rightful pension. Well, that's all right, but let me tell you, by giving this pension where it is needed, the nun will receive a good pension from Christ. I see what awaits us, and I am troubled. The years pass, and what difficult years they are. Our troubles are not over. The cauldron is boiling. If one is not strengthened spiritually, how can one face a difficult situation? God has not created human beings who are good for nothing. We must cultivate our philodemo. Indeed, if a great shake-up were to come upon us, God forbid, how many would remain standing? Before the 1940 war in, in Konitsa, where I had the carpentry shop near the marketplace, the villagers used to bring corn and wheat and so on. When these villagers would bring their corn to sell at the market, some wealthy people, who were not really wealthy, but they did earn a small interest on their deposited money, would kick the sack and disinterestedly ask how much it cost. But when war came, they had to sell everything they owned in order to survive. These same people would come to the market, and when the villagers said, Good morning, they would ask, Have you any corn to sell? This is why you should thank God for all things. Tighten your belts a little and become frugal. I see what awaits us, and I am troubled. Do not allow yourselves to get slack. Have you any idea what Christians are going through in other places? This was a footnote stated in 1987. In Russia, they are still in labor camps. What hardships they have to endure. There are no books for spiritual edification. And what about poor Albania and the great misfortune there? They don't even have anything to eat. Churches and monasteries have all been shut down. People even had to change their names so that they don't sound Christian. Even in America, the Orthodox Christians are few and scattered in different places. Do you know what they're going through? Without an Orthodox community, they have to take the train miles and miles away just to go to church. Some come to the Holy Mountain to, sp to seek spiritual guidance. It is a great ingratitude on our part to have such an inverate spirit prevailing in Greece. God will reveal many saints in the countries where communism was in power, martyrs who chose death. They held important positions but could not agree with laws, contrary to the law of God. I cannot agree with this. Kill me, throw me into prison, they would say, so that the others would also not be misled. Here in our country, without having to, so many are showing such great indifference. It would be different if they were going through some hardships a war, or difficult years, but now it's as if nothing is going on. How should one say this? It's like someone arriving from Australia by airplane to Greece in the springtime and then departing for Australia in autumn, only to arrive there in springtime again. They go from spring to spring with no winter in sight, no sense of cold and heavy weather. Yanada, how can we help a person who is indifferent? 
We need to instill in him the good concern, the good restlessness, perturb him so that he'll want to do something to help himself. It cannot be done by force. A person must be thirsty before you can give him water. Try giving food to someone who isn't hungry. He will throw up. When the other person does not want something, I cannot deprive him of his freedom, his free will. Ignorance is not justifiable. Yaronde, is it possible that some people are indifferent because they're simply ignorant and uninformed? What ignorance? Let me tell you about a case of ignorance. A literature teacher from Halkidiki did not know what the holy mountain is. A German teacher spoke to him about the holy mountain and they came together for a visit. The German man even knew how many monasteries there are on the holy mountain. And even though a Protestant, he also knew about the sacred relics and where each one was. Now, is such ignorance justifiable among our people? Another person from America advised someone from Halkiriki again to come to help me, to help me with the problem he was having. From America, mind you. Let me tell you something else. Someone came to my hut from Florina. I asked him, are you from within F Florina? And he said, yes, from within the city. So I told him, you have a, a very good metropolitan there. Then he asked me, what football team does he play with? He thought I was talking about a football player. He was so immersed in the game of football that he didn't even know the local bishop. At least Augustine Can Cantiotis is a well-known bishop. Such ignorance is not justifiable. No, ignorance cannot be justified in the world today. What is missing is philotimo, the good disposition. He who has the good disposition of coming to know Christ will come to know him. He will make a turn and come to meet him. And even if there is not a theologian or a monk to teach him the word of God, as long as he has good disposition, he will make the turn to Christ either from an encounter with a snake or a wild beast or from a lightning, from a storm or some other event in his life. God will provide the means. A young anarchist had gone to Germany. There he was confined to a reformatory because he'd gotten involved with drugs. He had no help from anyone. In the reformatory, someone gave him a New Testament. He read it and immediately changed. He said, I will go to Greece. That's where orthodoxy is. He returned to his village and his relatives were intent on finding him a wife. He got married and had a child. He continued to read the New Testament, go to church, observe the fasts and the feasts. The others who saw him live like that said, he must have gone crazy to be reading the New Testament. After a while, his wife abandoned him and took the child with her. When his wife left him, he left everything he had in the village, fields, tractor, and so on, and went to live in his ascetic, in a cave. A spiritual father, however, advised him to go find his wife first, talk with her, and then decide what to do. So he set off for Thessaloniki to find his wife and child. He believed, since the spiritual father so advised him, that Christ would reveal her. Christ did not reveal his wife in Thessaloniki. In the meantime, he found some Germans and instructed them in the faith. One of them was baptized. The Germans paid the fare for the young man to go to Athens to seek his wife there but he did not find her there either. Again, someone helped him to go to Crete. He started working there and went to see a spiritual father. When the spiritual father heard his problem, he told him, Is your wife and child like this, like that? There is a woman working here who arrived recently. And he described the woman to him. She must be the one, the young man said. The father informed her, and as soon as she looked upon her husband, she exclaimed, How did you find me? Are you a sorcerer? Did you find me with the help of sorcery? She turned away and left him again before they could even begin to talk. He lost her for a second time. He heard about me, and he came to visit me in my cell. He knocked once and waited. He stood to the side doing prostrations until I would open the door. He was wearing old and worn clothing. He told me the whole story. I had some dry figs and offered them to him. Do you want some figs? I asked him. I have no teeth, he replied. 
I don't have any either, I told him. Are you in pain? He asked me and added, I am in pain, and out of pain comes the joy of Christ. I asked him again, Do you want a sweater? I have two, he said, and if the weather warms up, I will give one away to someone. Then I told him, Until you clear up the situation with your wife, you must take care of your health because you have a responsibility to your child, too. Such self-denial, such faith that young man had. He wasn't yet 27 years old. Imagine if he had come to know the monastic life. He had total ignorance, but he had also a good disposition, and God helped him to make profound evangelical progress. This is why I say that ignorance cannot be justified in any way today. Only if someone is mentally deficient or a small child can he be justified for being ignorant. But then again, even little children today are so bright. If one really wants to, there are many opportunities to learn the truth. Chapter 2 The presence of a Christian is a confession of faith. Yet, under, do the various movements, demonstrations, and protests carried out by Christians have any positive results? The presence of Christians is now a confession of faith. Someone may be of more help through prayer, but his silence will be exploited by others who will say, so-and-so did not protest, therefore he is on our side, he agrees with us. If some of us do not begin to strike back at evil, to reproach those who scandalize the faithful, greater harm will be done. The faithful will be somewhat encouraged, and at the same time those who are attacking the church will be somewhat hindered. The church is not their boat to go sailing with. It is the ark of Christ. And those who attack the church are censurable. They are only interested in having big salaries, expensive cars, and entertainment. And then they make laws for civil marriages. They legalize abortions. As to what God will do, that is another matter. And with the blasphemous movies being produced these days, they want to ridicule Christ. Essentially, they're saying, that's who Christ was, but now will come the real Messiah. Then they go on to present their own Messiah. This is what they seem to be aiming at. People yet to believe these things and are harmed. Those already harmed are harmed all the more. People believe these things because they want to justify the unjustifiable and to ease their conscience. With all this blasphemy, they're seeking to justify moral and spiritual disorders. They have overdone it. They filed a lawsuit against the movie, The Last Temptation of Christ. Footnote, the blasphemous movie, The Last Temptation of Christ, directed by Martin Scorsese, was shown for a short while in theaters of Athens in 1988. The storm of protests and demonstrations created by the faithful and the Church of Greece forced the theaters to sh stop showing it. The elder, in spite of the pain he endured from his hernia, came out from the holy mountain together with other monks to be present at the demonstration in Thessaloniki and to support the faithful people with his presence. To continue, they filed a lawsuit against the movie The Last Temptation of Christ as being blasphemous to the Christian religion, and the public prosecutors said, Oh, it is nothing. Such blasphemies had not been heard before. For us, the protest against that blasphemous movie was a confession of faith. Of course, with all these blasphemous things, there also comes a good thing. The wheat is separated from the chaff. People are passed through the sieve. Yaronda, are there issues which we as individuals or as groups should defend or and other issues which we should not? When you, for example, were called a heretic, you responded, but with other criticisms, you kept silent. This is the consensus of the Holy Fathers, and not my own opinion. Any other accusation helps me in the spiritual life, while the accusation of being a heretic separates me from Christ. People are being lulled to sleep. Yaronda, with everything that is going on in the world today, how can people get some help? The one who really desires to be helped can indeed be helped through insignificant things. For example, a vigil oil lamp is seen moving back and forth 
where the person himself is shaken by an earthquake and he recovers from his indifference. But those who do not believe in the first place become worse when they hear that a war will break out or some catastrophe will take place. Let's have a good time now, they reason. Life's too short. So they pull out all the stops. In the past, even the indifferent ones would recover and change their way of life when a war was about to break out. Now such people are very few. In the past, our nation lived spiritually, and God would bless it, and our saints helped us overcome our enemies, who were always more numerous than us. Today we say that we are Orthodox Christians, but unfortunately we often only have the name Orthodox, but not the Orthodox way of life. Once I asked a spiritual father who was active in society and had many spiritual children, what do you know, what do you know about a blasphemous movie? I know nothing about it, he told me. He knew nothing about it and yet was guiding so many people in a big city. People are being lulled to sleep. They want people in the dark, carefree and having a good time. One must not dare to speak about an impending war or that we must prepare ourselves for the second coming. God forbid that we should cause the people to worry over such things. It is like some old ladies who say, don't talk about death. Talk only of joyful things and baptisms, as if death is not waiting for them too. So they have a false sense of joy. On the other hand, if they were to think about the aged man down the street who died yesterday, or the other one who has come to an end of his life and will soon die, or that a memorial service is being held the day after tomorrow for someone much younger than they, then they might be inclined to think about death and say, I must go to confession, prepare myself spiritually, for Christ may call me soon to the other life. Otherwise, death in time will take them unprepared. Some others, again, out of supposed kindness, give the following advice. Don't tell the heretics that they are in error to show them love. So everything is leveled. If these people had lived during the early years of Christianity, we wouldn't have had a single saint. In those years, Christians were told, just throw some incense in the fire for the emperor and do not deny Christ. And they would not accept this. Just pretend you're throwing incense. Again, they refused. Don't talk about Christ and go quietly to some other area. Again, they did not accept any compromise. But today one sees so many lukewarm people. Yet under when the Apostle Paul writes, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Galatians 5.22, does he mean that joy is an indication of a proper life? Yes, because there is worldly joy and divine joy. When something is not spiritual, pure, there cannot be true joy and peace of heart. The joy experienced by a spiritual person is not the worldly joy sought by many today. Let's not mix things up. Did the saints have the kind of joy we are seeking today? Did Panagia have such joy? Did Jesus go around laughing? Which saint has gone through this life without pain? Which saint had the joy sought by many present-day Christians who do not want to hear anything unpleasant, who do not want to worry or lose their serenity? If I do not want to worry or be troubled so that I may be happy, if I do not want to lose my serenity, so that I may be meek, then I am indifferent. Spiritual meekness and meekness out of indifference are two different things. Some people say, I must be cheerful because I am a Christian. I must be calm because I am a Christian. Such people are not Christians. Do you understand? That is indifference. It is wor worldly joy. One who has these worldly elements is not a spiritual person. A spiritual person is a mass of pain. That is to say, a spiritual person is pained over circumstances, over people, but is compensated for this pain by divine consolation. He does feel pain, but inside he also feels divine consolation, for God is pouring blessings from paradise, and man is overjoyed with divine love. This is the, the joy, the spiritual joy, which is not expressed, but rather abounds in the heart. The example speaks. 
Yeronda, should people living a spiritual life in the world let others know that they're fasting? When it is a matter of the prescribed times of fasting, such as Wednesdays, Fridays, and the other Lenten seasons, then we should, because it is a confession of faith. The other ascetic fasts, that is those which are undertaken for the love of Christ or for our prayer of petition to be heard, those should be practiced in secret. Our goal is to live in, in an orthodox way, not simply to speak or to write in an orthodox way. This is why, you see, a sermon does not inform, does not change the life of a person, no matter how good it is, unless the preacher is actually living the faith. Yet under what happens if the one who hears or reads a sermon has a good and open disposition? Well, then he already has divine grace, and that's why he can benefit from such a sermon. One who does not have this good disposition, however, will take and examine what the preacher is saying and will not receive any spiritual benefit from it. It is relatively easy to think in an orthodox way. To live the orthodox way of life requires effort. Once a theologian gave a talk urging people to go and donate blood because there was a shortage, and indeed many were motivated to go and donate blood. However, he himself did not donate even a single drop, even though he had plenty. The people were then scandalized. But he responded by saying, by speaking to the people and motivating them to donate blood counts as if I had given much more. Thus, he was able to ease his conscience. It would have been better if he had not given the talk, but gone to donate a little blood of his own. One's life is what counts. I am a rightist, someone told me, who had no relationship with the church whatsoever. If you do not even make the sign of the cross, how can that be of benefit to you? I told him. A hand that does not make the sign of the cross has no particular benefit for being the right hand. How does it differ from the left hand that does not make the sign of the cross? If you are a rightist, and you do not make the sign of the cross, how do you differ from the leftists? The goal is to be a spiritual person living close to Christ. Then you can be helpful to others as well. When a person lives aright, then his work will inform others. A certain Protestant lived in a city and was critical of everybody, the clergy, the bishops, everyone, without exception. Not far from there, a certain monk lived an ascetic life in a monastery. At one point, an atheist asked the Protestant, All right, you criticize all the bishops and all the clergy. What do you have to say about that monk? Him I accept, he said, because he differs from the others. A faithful person who lives authentically will be of benefit to others, no matter where he may be. I remember a friend of mine who served as a policeman on the northern borders. In the area, there were some Serb communists who were real atheists and committed members of the party. When Serb priests came to the Greek-Serbian border, the policemen would kiss their hand. The communists noticed this. A Greek policeman was kissing the hand of Serb priests. This made an impression upon the communists, and they reconsidered the issue of faith. How helpful are those people who have an important position and uphold the faith and traditions, this is why I try to see some important people when they come to me. I want to help them because they in turn can help others with their good example. There is a field marshal I know who is such an example. Whatever he does is from within, from the heart, not superficial. Others who observe his way of life question themselves and are benefited. In the past, the local leaders had principles. They believed. Do you know what a prominent lady had said to a parliamentary in the city? She had attended a dinner with her husband during the Dormition fast, and there was fish and meat on the table. She wasn't eating because she was keeping the fast. The parliamentarian noticed her and made the familiar remark. The sick and the travelers need not keep the fast. Oh, yes, especially those traveling with ease in their car, she replied and did not touch any of the non-Lenten food. Meanwhile, there was also a clergyman at the same dinner who addressed the group by saying, It is my honor to be here with you this evening. 
and going on and on with endless praises and compliments. At one point, the clergyman was interrupted by the husband of the notable lady with an appropriate verse from the Psalms. Psalm 145, verse 3. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. The clergyman had obviously gone there to flatter the guests. On another occasion, the same lady had said to a university professor of theology, Please do not fuss too much over minor details and fail the priests in their examinations. Try to help them pass their examinations because there is such a great need for priests in the countryside. The point I want to make is that in the past, local officials and leading members of our society were interested in the church and served as an example for the people. What will have a positive impact on people today is our Christian example and our Christian life. Christians should be distinguished by spiritual heroism, nobility, sacrifice. This is why I tell lay people, love Christ, be humble, do your duty, and Christ himself will reveal your virtue to others. Virtue has a rule of its own by which it will reveal a person wherever he may be. Even if one should conceal himself or even pretend to be a fool for Christ's sake, virtue will definitely be revealed, even at a later time, and the stored treasure, revealed altogether at last, will again help many souls, perhaps then even more. God endures us. Today, God is tolerating the state of affairs. He tolerates and tolerates so that the evildoers will be unjustifiable. There are circumstances where God intervenes directly and immediately, while in others he, he waits. He does not provide the solution immediately and waits for the patience of the people, their prayer, their struggle. God demonstrates such nobility there's one who had killed so many back then during the war, and yet he is still living. God will tell him in the other life, I allowed you to live much longer than the devout people. He will be allowed no mitigating circumstances. Yet why is it that sometimes such people do not die, even though they're very sick? It seems they have had some grave sins, and for this they do not die. God is waiting and giving them time to repent. What about the people they harm? The innocent who are harmed receive credit, but those who are guilty are paying off debts. Yet, yeah, what is meant by the phrase, evil men and, and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceivers and deceived? Footnote 2 Timothy 3.13 Look, there are some people who have some egoism, and God gives them a slap so that they will lower themselves a little. Others have a little more egoism, and God gives them a slap so that they'll lower themselves even more. But those who have satanic pride, God leaves them alone. It may appear that they are prosperous, but what prosperity is that? It is a dismal prosperity. And afterwards, they do not simply fall down, they go directly into the abyss. God save us. The Defense of Justice. Yet yeah, one of the hymns says, Arousing a most righteous anger. What anger is most righteous? A footnote, a phrase in the Apostolion hymn among the praises for the feast of the Holy Fathers of the First Ecumenical Council. To continue. When others are being wronged and someone shouts in anger out of a real sense of pain and suffering, then that is a most righteous anger. When he is angry because he is wronged, then that is not pure anger. When you see someone suffering for the sake of sacred things, he has divine zeal. This is how you can understand one who has become a fool for Christ. For example, if you take an icon and place it upside down before him, the fool for Christ will react with great agitation. That's how you can put him to the test. In other words, there is a righteous divine indignation and only this indignation is justifiable in man. When Moses saw the people sacrificing to the golden calf, he got very angry and threw down the tablets of stone with the commandments given to him by God, and they broke. 
Phineas, the grandson of the high priest Aaron, had committed two murders, and yet God established a covenant whereby the perpetual priesthood of Israel would derive from him and his descendants. When he saw the Israelite man, Zimri, sinning with the Midianite woman, Cosby, before Moses and all the Israelites, Phineas could not control himself. He rose and slew both of them, putting an end to God's anger. Had he not slain both of them, the wrath of God would have befallen all of the people of Israel. Footnote, Numbers chapter 25, verses 1 to 15. What a fearful thing. When I read in the Psalter the verse, then Phineas stood up and interposed, and the plague was stayed. This is Psalm 105, verse 30 from Septuagint to continue. I kiss his name many times. Even Christ himself, when he saw in the temple courtyard merchants selling calves, sheep, doves, and the money changers, took a whip and drove everybody out. John chapter 2, verses 14 and following. When a spiritual person tries to defend himself indignantly in a personal matter, this is clearly selfish, an act of temptation. Such a person is subject to external demonic influences. If someone is being wronged or ridiculed, Others should defend him for the sake of justice, not for their own self-interest. It is not right for you to quarrel on your own behalf. It is, of course, another matter if you react to defend serious spiritual matters, matters that relate to our faith, to orthodoxy. You have a responsibility to do this. When you are thinking of others and you react in order to help them, then this is a pure activity because it is prompted by love. When I was at Mount Sinai, I would go down to the monastery each week or every 15 days to receive Holy Communion. One time, a very simple dikaios, a footnote, in the Holy Monastery of Mount Sinai, dikaios is the, called the person responsible for the Holy Assembly when the Archbishop is not present in the monastery. To continue, he was there and he told me not every week monks should receive Holy Communion only four times a year. At that time, they had a rule not to receive Holy Communion frequently. I used to wear the monastic hood, and he said, no monastic hood either. They only wore it during the feasts. I said, may it be so with your blessing. So I put it over my shoulder like a scarf and gave it no further thought. Was I to quarrel over this? In the meantime, I would prepare myself for Holy Communion and attend the Divine Liturgy. When the priest said, With fear of God, faith, and love draw near, I would bend my head and say, You know, my Jesus Christ, how much need I have for Holy Communion. And I would feel such a transformation, which I do not know that I would have felt had I received Holy Communion. After a number of months passed, several young men came to the monastery, urged by me to come to Mount Sinai. They too were told not to receive Holy Communion frequently. Well, then I spoke up, and the matter was properly settled. Facing up to abusive insults. Yet on the sacred scripture says that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is not forgiven. What is this blasphemy? Footnote Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is in general disregard for holy and sacred things, provided, of course, the person is sane. Then he's guilty too. For example, to one who told me, get out of here, you and your gods, I gave a hard shove because that was blasphemy. Or two people are passing by a church. One of them makes the sign of the cross and urges the others to do the same, but he resists. I will not make the sign of the cross. Such contempt is blasphemy. Thus it is impossible for blasphemy to exist in a devout person. But even impudence is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. The impudent person distorts or disobeys, for example, an evangelical commandment in order to justify his fallen state. Such a person does not respect the truth, reality, but knowingly distorts it and tramples upon a sacred object or principle. 
Such an attitude gradually becomes constant. In time, the grace of God is lost, and the person is subject to demonic attacks. If he does not repent, oh, the consequences he is to bear. God forbid. But if one becomes angry and blasphemes even against the Holy Spirit, this blasphemy is not unforgivable. It is not something he actually believes, but something he said in a moment of anger when he had lost control and immediately repents. The impudent, however, will justify the lie in order to justify his fall. Whoever justifies his fall justifies the devil. Yerunda, how does someone justify his fall? A person may recall something said 10 years ago in a very different context and present it as an example to justify himself. Not even the devil himself, the greatest legalist, could conjure up something like that at that moment. And how does such a person feel? How does he feel? He never has any rest. If even someone who is in the right does not find peace when attempting to justify himself, you can imagine the person who is not in the right and who is trying to justify his fall in a most impudent manner. For this reason, we must be careful to avoid any impudence and scorn, not only of sacred things, but also of our neighbor, who is an image of God. Impudent people are at the first level of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Those who despise and scorn sacred and holy things are at the second level. And at the third level is the devil himself. Yet another, when people speak against the church or against monasticism and so on, what should one do? First of all, if someone speaks badly about you as a person, this does not matter. Just remember, Jesus, who was God himself, could not speak, would not speak out when abused and reviled. What do I, who am a sinner, deserve? If people came to abuse me as an individual, it would not trouble me at all. But when they abuse me as a monk, they also abuse the whole institution of monasticism. For the monk is not independent, and therefore I must speak up. In such circumstances, we should give people a little time to have their outburst and then tell them a few things. Once a lady on the bus was being abusive about priests. I gave her time to have her say, and when she had finished, I said, we have ex expectations of our priests, but we forget that God did not send them down to us with parachutes from heaven. They are human beings with human weaknesses. But can you tell me, a mother like you, all painted up with cosmetics and fingernails like a hawk's, what kind of child will she bear and raise? And if this child were to become a priest or a monk, what will he be like? I remember on another occasion when traveling from Athens to Yeena by bus, a man was talking incessantly about a metropolitan who had at that time created certain problems. I told him only two or three words and then continued to pray in silence. He just went on with his abuse. When we arrived in Yehenna, I took him aside and told him, Do you know who I am? No, he said. Then how can you say such things? I could be far worse than the person you are reviling, or I could be a saint. How can you sit there and say terrible things which I cannot imagine even worldly people doing? Try to correct yourself from being so abusive to others. Otherwise, you will receive a strong slap from God. For your own sake, of course. After that, I noticed he began to tremble. Even the others around us understood, as I realized from the commotion that followed. You see, people abusing and reviling holy and sacred things, and others not saying anything. Being meek on such an occasion is demonic. Once, when I was coming out of the holy mountain, I met on the boat a poor man who had left a psychiatric hospital and come to the holy mountain. He was constantly ranting and cursing all the prominent people in government at the hospital. For so many years now, they've worn me out with electric shocks and behavior-controlling drugs. You monks have it good here with your comforts, your cars. From 12 years old, my mother sent me to an island. For 25 years, I've been going from one psychiatric clinic to another. 
He continued to blame all the political parties. And then he started being abusive of Christ and Panagia. Then I got up, went to him and said, stop right now. Then I asked, are there no people in authority here? Apparently his escort was offended. He must have been a policeman and he calmed, and he calmed him down a little. He had expressed all his problems with loud, abusive outbursts. I felt sorry for him. Later he came, kissed my hand. I too kissed him. He was right. All of us, more or less, have our share of responsibility. I too was in, in part the cause for this poor man's abusive talk. Had I had the necessary spiritual spirituality, perhaps I could have made him well. At the time of the exchange of populations following the Asia Minor catastrophe, the people of Farasa were very sad on the boat bringing them to Greece. Two sailors were arguing and cursing Christ and Panagia. This was unbearable to them. Greeks, Christians, cursing Christ and Panagia? They grabbed the two sailors and threw them into the sea. Fortunately, they knew how to swim and were saved. When an ordinary person is being abused, we should support and defend him. How much more so when Christ himself is reviled. Once a young man who came, who was lame, came to my hut, but his face was aglow with an extraordinary light. I thought to myself, something is going on here for divine grace to be so obvious. I asked him how he was, and he told me what had happened. Someone, a big and strong man, was abusive of Christ and Panagia, and the, the young man rushed upon him to stop the abuse. But the abuser put the young man down and beat him, crippling him and leaving him lame. He was a confessor. Oh, what suffering was endured by the confessors and the martyrs. Yet under some devout young men are troubled while serving their military duty by those who are abusive and curse, what should they do? This requires discernment and patience. God will help. The wireless operator that I worked with in the army was a blasphemous, unbelieving doctor. Every day he would come to the administrative unit to brainwash me with his ideas. He talked to me about Darwin's theory of evolution and other such things, things entirely blasphemous. But after a particular event, he began to understand a few things. Once we were on a mission and we had loaded the wireless equipment and the carrier on a large mule. On a downhill and slippery path, I was holding on to the mule's tail and the doctor was pulling on the reins. Suddenly, as the carrier slightly touched the animal's ears, the mule gave a strong kick with its hind legs and threw me with force to the side. As I recovered, I realized that I was still walking. The only thing I remember is shouting, my Panagia, nothing else. The mule's hoofs were imprinted on my body. My chest was all black and blue. The animal had kicked with such force. The doctor was very surprised to see me walking. We continued on our mission. A little further on, the doctor lost his footing on a rock, fell, and could not get up to walk. He started shouting, My Panagia, my Christ, what will become of me? Who will help me? He was afraid of being captured. Don't worry, I told him. I will stay with you. If they capture me, they'll capture you. The poor fellow then started thinking, Arsenios, footnote, this was the name of St. Paisios in the world before becoming a monk. As baptized by his new no, Saint Arsenios the Cappadocian. To continue, even though the mule kicked him, Arseni, even though the mule kicked him so hard and threw him flying, did not suffer a thing, while I, who merely lost my footing, am now unable to walk. After a while, he got up with difficulty and I helped him as he limped. The others in the unit have moved ahead. The doctor got a good lesson that day. Every day, he was shouting his blasphemies without restraint. And then at the time of danger, he started shouting, my Panagia, my Panagia. Panagia was now convenient for him. Another person, a motorcyclist in the army, had broken his leg twice and still he continued to curse and be abusive. Couldn't you tell him something, Yerunda? What could I tell him? 
Here, I was telling him nothing, and he was constantly cursing Christ and Penegi on purpose, just to annoy me. Once I realized that, I only prayed. As you know, while at first he and others cursed for no good reason, later when they experienced some difficulty and were about to curse, they would bite their tongue. When someone is cursing, blaspheming, or being impudent, it is better to pretend to be busy and not listen and to say the Jesus prayer. For if he sees that you are paying attention to him, he may continue to curse all the more, and you can then become a cause for his demonic influence. If, however, one is not impudent, but is conscientious and curses out of a bad habit, you can say something to him. If, again, one is conscientious, but has a great deal of egoism, you must be careful not to speak sternly to him, but rather, you have to be as humble as you can and speak to him with pain. What does St. Isaac say? Confute those who dispute with you by the strength of your virtues and not by the persuasiveness of your words. By the meekness and quietness of your lips, put the impudence of the obstinate to silence. Reprove the wanton by the nobility of your life and those who are shameless as regard the senses by the modest curbing of your eyes. Footnote, St. Isaac the Syrian's ascetical homily number four. Chapter three. To the pure, all things are pure. Titus chapter one, verse 15. The spiritual person is a consuming fire. Yet the, how can someone live a proper Christian life in today's society without being scandalized by those who live far from God? Why should anyone be scandalized by others who do not live close to God? If you were in a family with six or eight siblings and one or two of them were led into error by Satan to live a sinful life, would their sinful life scandalize you? No, I would grieve, for they are my brother and sister. Well then, the evil is within us. We have no love, and for this reason we do not consider all people our brothers and sisters and are scandalized by their life. We are all one big family and are brothers and sisters among ourselves, for we are all children of God. If we truly feel that we are brothers with all human beings, we will care for those living in sin and will not be scandalized by their sinful life, but instead will pray for them with pain. Therefore, if we are scandalized, the evil is within us, not outside. When you feel scandalized, you should ask yourself, how many do I scandalize? In God's name, shouldn't I tolerate my brother or sister? How does God tolerate me with all the things that I do? Think of God, of Panagia, the angels who look upon all the people of earth as if standing on a balcony and looking down on a, on a plaza. They see some stealing, others fighting, still others sinning carnally, and so on. How does God tolerate them all? How is it that he can tolerate all the evil and all the sin on earth, and we cannot tolerate even one brother or sister? It is awful. Yet under what does St. Paul mean when he says that God is a consuming fire? Deuteronomy 4.24 and Hebrews 12.29 If you throw papers, trash into a furnace, what will become of them? Won't they be burned up and consumed? It is the same with the spiritual person. Whatever temptation is thrown at him will be burned up and consumed. A consuming fire. When the divine fire lights inside man, everything is burned. No evil thought can stick to him. In other words, the devil will hurl at him all kinds of evil thoughts. But the spiritual man is a fire that burns them up. In which case the devil grows weary of doing this and eventually stops. This is why St. Paul the Apostle also writes, To the pure all things are pure. The pure see everything as pure. There is nothing impure. Even when thrown into the mire, the pure will remain pure, like the rays of the sun, which no matter where they fall, remain bright and pure. The spiritual person is transformed for the better by the saint and is not irritated by the carnal person. He sees a carnal person and feels pain for him, but suffers no harm. Another person who is in a moderate state of spirituality is transformed for the better by a truly spiritual person. However, he is also transformed by a carnal person, 
but this time toward evil. A carnal person cannot distinguish a saint and is provoked by another carnal person. And while the possessed sees the saint and flees, the carnal person approaches a saint in order to tempt him and to scandalize him. One who is debased to the condition of the sodomites is scandalized even by the angels. The humble person, even when inexperienced spiritually, can distinguish the angel of God from the devil because he has spiritual purity and is related to the angel, whereas the egotist and carnal man, besides being easily beguiled by the cunning devil, transmutes, transmits cunningness himself, provoking with his carnality and harming the weaker souls with his spiritual germs. Yananda, how does one reach the spiritual state of being able to see everything as pure? The heart must be purified so the grace of God may find a place to rest. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Isn't that what is written in the psalm? When a man or a woman's heart is purified, then Christ comes to dwell in it, and then they no longer scandalize others, nor are they scandalized by others. Rather, they transmit grace and reverence. The person who is careful to maintain his spiritual purity also preserves divine grace. Then he sees everything in the light of purity and is also able to utilize the impure for good and spiritual purposes. This good work of spiritual transformation is accomplished in his good and spiritual factory. Unless papers are turned into clean and useful paper napkins, writing pads, and so on, old and broken bronze objects are turned into candlesticks and candle stands. In contrast, the person who accepts deviousness and thinks deviously will turn even good things into bad, like the factories which make ammunitions. They turn even gold into bullets and shells because that is what their machines are made for. When someone starts making confessions, concessions to sin, he darkens inside. The eyes of the soul are clouded and he can no longer see clearly. Moreover, he is polluted by sin and sin confuses and entangles him, causing him to see even the pure as sinful. There are people who cannot believe, for example, that some young people live pure and chaste lives. It's impossible for such a thing to happen today, they say. These poor souls are so immersed in sin that they see everything as sinful. People who sleep with the demons, tangalakia, this is how the elder often referred to the demons. People who sleep with the demons cannot imagine that others are sleeping with little angels. But we must not expect the swine to be respectful of the lovely lilies. You see, even Christ said, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast your pearls before the swine, lest they trample them under their feet. Matthew 7, 6. For this reason, anyone trying to live a truly pure and spiritual life must be very careful never to be too bold before worldly people or allow that they are spiritually in the right because they can do much harm and also be harmed to themselves. Keep in mind that worldly people have another rule and another canonarch and they cannot tell the difference between the holy myron and ordinary perfume. Yet under, can someone who wants to live close to Christ be hindered by external temptations. No, only our lack of a spiritual life can separate us from Christ. This is the work of the demon, to create scandals and to spread evil all around, to attack people sometimes head-on and at other times deviously. Christ loves us and is close to us when we live according to his will. For this reason, when you see scandals being created, do not be afraid and do not panic. If someone does not face up to reality in a spiritual manner, he will not enjoy a single day. For the devil will find his mark, that is his weak point, and will constantly create scandals against him. Today one thing, tomorrow another, the day after that, yet another. We ourselves should not create scandals. As far as possible, we should be careful not to give cause for ugly situations to develop. Let us not open cracks 
to the deceiver because the souls who have faulty thoughts are harmed and are only seeking an opportunity to justify themselves. Then we end up building with one hand and tearing down with the other. Some time ago, some, some young modern men came to my hut and we had a discussion. That day I was planning to go out from the holy mountain. When they learned of this, they too decided to leave the mountain and came and sat beside me in the boat. They were asking me with great interest about various spiritual matters. However, some people on the boat misunderstood this and were looking at us suspiciously. If I could have foreseen that others would misunderstand our conversation, I would have taken measures to prevent it. People are devious. We must be careful not to create scandals. We are not responsible for what we cannot take measures to prevent or for matters in which we have no experience. But we must not expect a reward from God when we create problems through carelessness. We have a reward when we are careful, but the enemy creates problems nonetheless. Someone tells me, for example, that I am in error. First, I will see if I am in error or not. I think to myself, for him to say that, he must have seen or heard something. He cannot just say that without any reason. He must have misunderstood something I said or did. And I try to find out where or how I have been misunderstood in order to correct it. If he says that I am in error, a sorcerer, this is a gain for me as people will not come to me and I will find some peace. But that poor man who says such things will be condemned because he harms the church. Isn't it the pity? And I am to blame because I was careless about something. Some people come to kiss my hand, and in an order, an effort to avoid it, I pat them lightly on the head. One who sees that says, Look, he is blessing them when he is only a monk. What does he think he is, a priest? It's not their fault. I should be careful not to do it again. Yaranda, when someone out of carelessness creates a scandal, some people make the remark, Leave him alone. He has the excuse of not being responsible for his actions. The excuse of irresponsibility applies only to one who cannot think, not the one who is careless. The careless person lights a fire and does not think that where he has lit it can cause a forest fire. When from time to time such a person lights a fire and singes a few other souls in the process, we have a duty to pray and pour a pail or two of water and onto the fire. Also, there are others who are headstrong. They are pious to a fault. And when they hear something they disagree with, they react violently, without first examining if it is right or wrong. It is then that we must sometimes discreetly step on the brakes. And again, when they stop, discreetly jam a stone against their tires to prevent them from rolling backwards and running over other souls. What scandal mongers some people are. Do not readily, readily believe everything you hear, for there are some people who relate things as they themselves understand them. Once someone went to Haji Ephenites, St. Arsenius of Cappadocia, and told him, Give me your blessing, Father Arsenios, because a hundred snakes have gathered up there. A hundred snakes? Where could they have possibly come from? Father Arsenios wondered. Well, if they were not one hundred, then surely there were fifty. Wow, fifty snakes! There were at least twenty-five, for sure. Again the saint wondered and asked, Have you ever heard of twenty-five snakes coming together? Stop it right there, it is not possible. Then he said there were certainly ten. Really, they were having a conference and ten snakes got together. There had to be five, the man said then. Five? Well, maybe just two. Then Father Arsenios asked him, did you see them? Well, no, but I heard them in the bushes making a loud hissing sound. So it could have been some lizard. I try to never draw any conclusions from whatever I hear until I've had a chance to examine the matter. Some people may say something to criticize. Others may simply be relating a story, while yet others may relate it with an ulterior motive. 
what scandal mongers some people are. In Konitsa, there were two friends who were very close. On holy days and Sundays, they didn't wander around the town, but instead came to visit the monastery in Stomion. They also enjoyed chanting. Afterwards, they would take a hike up the mountains to the camel, the mountain peak footnote on the mountain peak on the Pindos range, which has the appearance of a camel's hump. To continue, one day a perverse individual sowed discord between these two friends. He went to the one and said, do you know what your friend said about you? He said this and this, and he said that. Then he went to the other man and told him, hey, do you know what your so-called friend said about you? He said this and this and that and that. Soon after that, the two men had an awful argument right in the monastery. In the meantime, the instigator left the area, and the two men continued to argue terribly. The younger of the two was rather hot-tempered and started calling the older one names. Right then, thinking to myself, look what temptation can do. What shall I do now? I went to the older man and said, look, he's young and a little hot-tempered. Don't get him wrong. Apologize to him. Father, he tells me, how can I apologize to him? Don't you see how he's calling me names? I have no idea what he's talking about. Then I went to the younger man and said to him, look, he is older. Things are not as they seem to you. Go and apologize to him. But he got enraged and started shouting, Father, you and I are going to have a fight of our own as well. Well then, Pantelli, if we must fight, let me go and get ready. I said and went away. Outside the monastery, I had some long sticks I was planning to use for a garden fence. I walked about 400 meters and picked up a stick nearly five meters long and started to drag it slowly, hoping to make him laugh. He could see me dragging the stick, but could not imagine what I was going to do with it. Then I came into the courtyard, holding the stick in my hands and approached the area of the narthex. Then I said, come on, Pantelli, now I'm ready for our fight. And I poked him with the stick. That was it. Both men burst out laughing. The ice was broken. The devil went away, defeated. What foolishness was this? Are you fellows in your right mind now? I told them, and their friendship was restored. Was the slander spoken on that same day? Oh, yeah, yes, they were swearing at each other terribly. See what the devil can do? The other fellow was probably jealous of them, for their wonderful friendship, so he slandered the one to the other and then went away. Slander is truly evil, and this is why this type of temptation is called by the name of the tempter, that is, the diabolos, the devil. Footnote, calumny, slander in Greek is diab diaboli. To continue, he says one thing to one person and something else to another person in order to deceive and so discord. And you see how even good friends can believe the lies and be caught in the devil's snare. Did that individual spread the lies about the two friends intentionally? Yes, to separate them out of love, and namely envy. The Publication of Sins When we see something unseemly, it is better to cover it rather than make it a matter of public scorn and ridicule. It is wrong to publicize moral transgressions. If some foul-smelling waste material is found along a path, a prudent person will make some effort to cover it with a stone to prevent any further disgust. But an impudent individual, instead of covering it, may begin stirring it and spreading its foul smell even more. By the same token, when we indiscreetly publicize the sins of others, we bring about great harm. The scriptural verse, tell it unto the church, Matthew eighteen seventeen, does not mean that everything must be made public, because today not everyone is part of the church. The church is the faithful who live as Christ desires, not those who oppose the church. The verse, tell it unto the church, had that particular meaning during the early years of Christianity, 
when confession of sins was performed publicly before all the members of the church. In our time, when hardly a family can be found to have the same spiritual father, let us not be fooled by the devil with the otherwise meaningless verse, meaning full verse, tell it unto the church. For when we publicize a moral transgression, we make it known to the enemies of the church, giving them opportunity to oppose the church, thus shaking the faith of the weaker members. A mother who has a daughter who is a prostitute does not calumniate and ridicule her in front of others, but rather does everything in her power to restore her daughter's name. The mother will sell whatever she can to raise money. She will take her and go to another city. She will help her to get married in order to correct her former way of life. This is precisely the church's way. The benevolent God tolerates us with love and does not expose anyone, even though he knows the decadent condition of our heart. The saints, too, never embarrassed a sinner before other people. Instead, through love and spiritual sensitivity, they quietly tried to rectify and overcome the evil. We, however, even though we are sinners, do just the opposite, like hypocrites. We must be careful not to be easily shocked and think that whatever others do is evil. Yeronda, you referred to the publication of moral transgressions. What about other types of sins or sinful conditions? Is it necessary under certain circumstances to make them public? Let me explain. I do this to some of the people I know. For example, I see them I see someone doing something bad and scandalizing others. I tell that person one, five, ten, twenty, thirty times to correct himself, but he doesn't. He has no right to continue his disorderly behavior after being told repeatedly, as others will be misled and imitate him. You see, people readily imitate evil, not the good. So then I have to tell others who see this bad behavior in order to protect them. In other words, when I say what so-and-so is doing does not please me at all, it's not to condemn the person. I have already told him that so many times. It's because there's others who see his bad behavior are influenced and might imitate him. They may even say, well, since Father Paisios does not tell him anything, it must be all right. If I do not speak out that I am not pleased with this bad behavior, I give the impression that I am blessing it, that it pleases me. But then the whole is destroyed, for people will consider that particular behavior as acceptable and worthy of imitation. And what can come from that? In the meantime, they think that I have not spoken directly to the person about this matter. They have no idea that I have struggled with this matter for such a long time. And we also have the devil adding his share. It's all right if you do it. Look, that other person is doing it, and Father Paisios has not told him a thing. So when I see that someone continues his bad behavior, even though I've repeatedly asked him to correct it, I will make it a point of mentioning to anyone who knows him that so-and-so's behavior does not please me. And this I do, as I have said, to protect the innocent from evil influence. This is not condemnation. Let's not confuse the two. Now some will come and say to me, why did you tell this to others? It was a, a secret spoken in confidence. What secret? What confidence? I spoke to you a thousand times and you did nothing about it. You have no right to harm others who may think that I agree with such behavior. When harm can come to others, I have an obligation to speak up, and God forbid if I do not, especially when I am dealing with a young person from a family I happen to know, and I see that his behavior is destroying the family. I tell him, look, if you do not correct your ways, I will speak to your mother. You have no right to come and tell me and then to continue as you please. I will speak to your mother in order to protect your family. Now, if he feels repentance, that is all right. But when he continues his disorderly conduct, I must speak up. I have a responsibility to do so. Chapter 4. Actions with Prudence and Love. Cultivating Ourselves. If you want to help the church, it is better to try to correct yourself rather than be looking to correct others. If you manage to correct yourself, 
one small part of the church is immediately corrected. Naturally, if everyone did the same, the body of the church would be in good health. But today, people concern themselves with anything but themselves. You see, judging others is easy, whereas working on yourself takes effort. If we work to correct ourselves and look more intently toward our inner activity rather than our external, giving precedence to divine help, we can in turn be of greater and more positive help to others. We will also achieve an inner serenity that will quietly help the souls of the people we encounter. Because spiritual serenity reflects the virtue of the soul and transforms souls. When someone applies himself to external activity before having polished his spiritual inner state, he may struggle, ba struggle spiritually, but he will be fraught with worry, anxiety, lack of confidence in God, and frequent loss of serenity. If he does not improve himself, he cannot say that his interest for the common good is pure. When he is liberated from the old self and all things worldly, then he will receive divine grace and be not only at peace with himself, but also able to bring peace to everyone else. But if he has not received the grace of God, then he can neither govern himself nor help others in order to bring about a divine effect. He must first be immersed in divine grace and then utilize his resulting sanctified powers for the salvation of others. Good deeds must be done in a good way. Yaranda, how do you think when you have to deal with a problem? I think of what is humanly possible and what isn't. I examine it from all perspectives. I will do this. What consequences will it bear on this, on that? What good can it bring or what harm can it cause? I always try to see a problem from many aspects, so the solution I come up with will be as far as possible, the correct one. Many mistakes can be made if one is not careful. If one realizes that afterwards what should have been done, it is of no benefit because, as people say, the bird has flown. Let us say, for example, someone was being careless and burned a house. Well, perhaps no one will hang the man, but the damage has been done. People had a problem somewhere. The person in charge came to me and said, well, now the problem is solved. I went and found so-and-so. I told them this and that, and the matter is now settled. I said to him, the problem has just started. What you had in your hands was not a problem. Now the fire is really burning. At first, there were just two pieces of coal burning that would have burned out by themselves. That person thought that through his actions, the problem had been solved and even expected to be praised. Whereas with what he did, he created a big fuss and magnified the problem. It takes a lot of attention, prudence, and discernment because good must be done well and be of benefit to others, otherwise it may demonize them. Also, if there's something that you're thinking of doing, allow the thought to mature before doing it. If you act prematurely in haste, you may later have other problems to torment you. The serious issues when delayed a little, will later proceed properly and efficiently. Someone may be clever, but he may have vainglory and egotism, negative qualities that run ahead of his actions and lead to carelessness. For example, a hunting dog, even if not purebred, will find the rabbit if it advances carefully. On the other hand, a purebred dog with all the necessary qualities, if too hasty, will run left and right without any results. Action before thought contains pride. One must not be in a hurry to act. One must first think and pray before acting. When prayer comes first, then it is not the fourth, the froth of the mind. It's fr frivolity, but the sanctified mind that will guide the process. Spiritual people sometimes act as if there were no God. We do not allow God to act. God knows how to work. While there are spiritual means to solve difficult circumstances, we try to act by worldly means. When I was at Mount Sinai, every Friday, a Muslim cleric would go up to the minaret of a mosque at the monastery and cry out the call to prayer. And what a loud voice he had! 
I could hear him all the way up to the hermitage of Saint Epistemi. Later, the monastery found a way to prevent this by closing the door on Fridays, when the Muslim cleric would make his visit, and I knew nothing about this. One day on my way out, I saw the, the hoja furious. Now I will show them, he told me, for closing the door and not letting me in. They closed it, I told him, so the camels will not get in. I don't believe they closed it to keep you out. After that, I said something to the fathers about this. One of the secretaries replied, I'll show that Muslim cleric. I'll set him up. I will tell the government that the Muslim cleric is harassing us. Look here, I said. Orthodoxy is not into setups. Let's keep a vigil. Let us chant the service of the Holy Fathers of Sinai, of St. Catherine, and let us allow God to speak. I will also go up to pray. I also told a few of the fathers to pray, so that in the end the Muslim cleric received an effective slap in the face. He got up, left the area, and disappeared. For even if they had locked the door, the government would have seen that the cleric was not in fact harassing them, and they would be in trouble with the authorities. The cleric would have said that they closed the door to prevent him from entering the monastery each Friday, and this would have created a problem for the monastery. Another person in the past saw the awesome mountain and wanted to build a country home on the summit of St. Catherine. He fell ill, died, and was gone. Then another person came later to build something at the same place, but he too died and is gone. This is why we should not rely only on our own human efforts. We should pray and allow God to act. Discreet behavior. Yananda, when we see someone behaving badly, should we try to tell him something? It depends on what kind of person he is. It requires great discernment and divine enlightenment in our time. It is not easy to tell you exactly. In a given case, as I have seen, there can be 500 variables. There are some who can be corrected and others who cannot, and may even react badly to one of our remarks. Especially if someone is an egoist and you offend him, he will react badly. While often realizing he is wrong, he won't give in because of his egotism. And when our motives are not pure, when our concern for others is tainted with pride and our love for them is not pure, then those we try to help will react badly. When we censure someone with love, with pain, whether he understands our love or not, the transformation can take place in his heart simply because we are motivated out of pure love. But censuring someone without love, with animosity, will infuriate him because our, our evilness collides with his pride and causes sparks to fly, just like when the steel strikes the flint. When we endure our brother out of love, he understands it. Even when our evilness is not revealed but is kept inside. He can feel it because it agitates him. This is like the appearance of the devil in the form of an angel, which causes agitation and fear, while the real angel brings a peaceful, inexpressible exaltation. In other words, Yanand, if we say something and produce an agitated reaction, are we acting from egoism? Many misunderstandings occur as well. People interpret the same thing differently. One must always examine oneself. Why do I want to say this? What are my motives? Do I really suffer over this, or do I want to appear good, to project myself? If we are cleansed and purified, then whether we become angry, or we shout, or we censure, our motives will be pure, and everything will go well, because we are acting with discernment. For discernment is purification, divine enlightenment, spiritual clarity. Consequently, how can egotism enter into that equation? And when our motives are pure, we are at peace. This is how we can distinguish whether or not our every action is good. Often you may not realize that the manner in which you say something to someone has a bossy air about it. This must be done precisely in this or that manner only. Egotism enters into the picture and the other person explodes. 
If the motives are pure and there is humility, the instructive remark will be of help to the other person. Otherwise, egotism comes in and has the opposite effect. Remove yourself, your egotism, from your actions and then you will be motivated by pure reasons. Indiscreet behavior will often do more harm than the irresponsible behavior of the insane because the indiscreet would wound sensitive hearts with their sharp words and will often mortally traumatize them by leading them to desperation. There are some people who behave in the same manner toward everyone, but we cannot fit into a, a thimble what we can put into a barrel, nor can we load onto an ox as much as we can onto a horse. The ox is good for pulling the plow. It's inappropriate to saddle it and load it. The horse, again, is not meant for the plow, but to carry weight. One animal is made for one kind of work, and the other is fit for another. Let's not try to fit the whole world into our mold. Each one has his own. Let us overlook a few things when they're not harmful. If it were possible to put all the people in this life in order, then there would be no disorderly behavior, and we would have paradise here, too. So let's not have irrational expectations of others. The mark of spiritual sincerity is love. The world is in a sorry state nowadays because everyone is saying great truths which do not correspond with reality. Sweet words and great truths have value when they come from truthful mouths and they produce results on the well-intentioned and those who have a pure mind. Yaranda, is there a worldly sincerity and a spiritual sincerity? Yes, of course. Worldly sincerity contains indiscretion. Does this mean that someone speaks in season, out of season? Not only that, truth is truth. But if at some point you speak the truth without discernment, this is not truth. For example, it is true that so-and-so is mentally disturbed. But if you go and tell this truth, you do not benefit anyone. Or another person says, in order to be sincere, I am going to sin in the public square. This is not sincerity. Anyone who has a great degree of discernment also has noble love, sacrifice, and humility, and he speaks even the bitterest truth with great simplicity, sweetened with kindness. The benefits reaped are greater than those of sweet words as bitter medicines do greater good than sweet syrups. Truth when used without discernment, can be criminal. Some people act in the name of truth and commit crimes. When someone has sincerity without discernment, he can do double harm, first to himself and then to others, because this sincerity is without compassion. Whoever wants to be truly sincere should start by being sincere with himself, for that's where spiritual sincerity begins. When someone is not sincere with himself, He's at least only fooling and wronging himself. But when he behaves without sincerity toward others, he sins mortally because he fools others. Yaranda, is it possible for someone to act this way out of simplicity? What simplicity? Where did you ever find simplicity in such a person? If he is a child, he'll have simplicity. If he is a saint, he'll have simplicity. If he is an adult and is not mentally retarded but behaves in this manner, he must be a devil. And how does he feel? He feels like hell itself, one temptation after another, endless temptations. Yet there's no one then to behave forthrightly. Forthrightness, as many understand and use it, has a legalistic spirit. I am forthright, they say. I proclaim upon the housetops, footnote referring to Luke chapter 12, verse 3, and proceed to ridicule the other person, but they end up ridiculing themselves. The letter of the law kills, footnote 2 Corinthians 3, 6. Once I asked someone, what are you, a fighter for Christ or a fighter for temptation? You know that there are fighters for temptation, don't you? A Christian must not be a fanatic, but have love for everyone. Whoever hurls indiscreet words, even when he may be in the right, does harm. I once met an author 
who was devout and yet spoke to worldly people in a brutally frank way that was nonetheless profound and was thus able to shake them out of their complacency. Once he told me, in a gathering I said this and that to a lady. But by the manner in which he made his remarks, he had crippled the poor woman. He embarrassed her in front of everybody. Look, I told him, you're hurling golden crowns with diamonds at people. But the way you're throwing them, you're hurting heads, not just sensitive ones, but hard ones too. Let us not throw stones at people, Christian style. Whoever censures publicly someone who has sinned or whoever speaks with an animosity about someone, such a person is not motivated by the Spirit of God. He is moved by another spirit. The way of the church is love. It differs from the way of the legalists. The church sees everything with loving forbearance and seeks to help each person no matter what he has done or how sinful he may be. I notice in some devout people a rather strange type of logic. Their devotion and good intentions are all very well, but they also need to be spiritually discerning and broad-minded, so their devotion is not accompanied by narrow-mindedness or hard-headedness, that is, a stubborn and closed mind. The premise is to be in a spiritual state, to have spiritual discernment. Otherwise, one remains at the level of the letter of the law, and the letter of the law kills. He who has humility never takes on the air of an instructor. He listens, and when asked of his opinion, he speaks humbly. He never says, I, but rather, my thought tells me, or the fathers tell us. He speaks like a student. Anyone who thinks that he can correct others thinks far too highly of himself. Yet when someone sets out with good intentions to do something only to go to extremes, does he lack discernment? Pride has infiltrated his activity, but he does not realize it because he does not know himself yet, and that's why he goes to extremes. People often start out piously, but get lost. This is what happened during the iconoclast controversy between the iconodules and the iconoclasts. Extremes on one side, extremes on the other. The icon Odulis went as far as to scrape the paint off the icon of Christ and put it into the chalice to improve Holy Communion. The iconoclasts would either burn the icons or throw them away. This is why the church was forced to place the icons high up, and once the controversy subsided, the icons were lowered for the people to venerate them and to render honor to the persons they represented. Whatever we do, we must do for God. Yeronda, usually I am motivated by fear of hurting other people's feelings or of lowering myself in their eyes. I don't think about disappointing God. How can I increase my fear of God? We need to be vigilant. Whatever we do, we must do for God. We forget God, and then the thought that we are doing something important enters our mind. We become overly concerned with being liked by others, and then we worry about not lowering ourselves in other people's eyes. Instead, if we proceed with the thought that God sees us, that He is observing us, then what we do is sure. Otherwise, if we do something in order to appear good to others, then everything is lost. Every effort is wasted. For every action of his, man must ask himself, What I am doing pleases me, but does it also please God? And must examine whether it is pleasing to God. If we forget to do this, then we also forget God. That's why in the old days they used to say, For God's sake, or, Oh, that godless man, he has no fear of God. Or else people would say, God willing, or if God permits. People felt the presence of God everywhere. They kept God constantly before them. And they were careful. They actually lived what the psalm says. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Psalm 15, verse 8 from the Septuagint. And they do not waver or move away from God. Now, you see, the European way of life is gradually entering our society, and many people are well-behaved out of a worldly sense of good manners. Whatever we do, we must do purely for Christ. 
keeping in mind that Christ sees us and is observing us. Christ must be at the center of our every action. The human element must not get in the way. If we act out of a need to be liked by others, this does not benefit us at all. We need to be very careful. I have to always examine the motives for my action, and as soon as I detect that I am motivated by a need to be liked by others, then I must strike it down at once. For when I try to do good, but my need to be liked by others gets in the way, this is like drawing water from the well with a sieve for a bucket. Most temptations are often created by ourselves when we include the self in any cooperation with others. That is, when we are motivated by self-interest and want to elevate ourselves and seek our personal gratification. One rises to heaven through spiritual descent, not through worldly ascent. Whoever walks lowly always walks securely and never falls. This is why we should uproot as far as we can the worldly concern to project ourselves and achieve worldly success, which leads to spiritual failure. We should reject hidden and obvious egotism and the superficial need to be liked by others. So we can come to love Christ most sincerely. Our time is not characterized by what is discreet and noiseless, but by what is impressive yet empty. The spiritual life, however, is discreet and noiseless. It is good to do what is well within our means quietly, without ambitions, displays beyond our capabilities, because otherwise it will be at the expense of our soul and body, and often at a high cost to the church as well. By truly pleasing our neighbor, we also please Christ. It is here that we must be very careful to purify our agreeableness to, toward our neighbor, to eliminate the need to please others, and to allow this human offering also to go to Christ. When someone is attempting to base ecclesiastical issues upon supposedly orthodox models, but his aim is simply to position himself more favorably, to seek his own self-interest, how can he ever be blessed by God? As much as possible, he must try to conform to the will of God. He must always examine himself and see how he can perform the will of God. When he performs the will of God, then he is related to God. And then, without even asking for it from God, he receives. He receives endless living water from the source. Let us acquire a spiritual sense. The Holy Spirit is one, but has many gifts. It does not vary from place to place. The Holy Spirit is not a spirit of confusion. It is one of love, peace. When spiritual men attack one another, this means that they are under the influence of many other spirits, which have no relation to the one Holy Spirit. In the past, the Holy Spirit illumined, guided. It was a matter of utmost importance. Today, the conditions for the Holy Spirit to descend do not exist. The Babylonia of the Old Testament was innocent. You'd ask for clay and they would bring you straw. Now we have a Babylonia with passions. You ask for clay and they throw a brick at your head. But if someone can eliminate the self from his every activity and curtail his own will, then he can work properly and certainly have the divine enlightenment to create a spirit of understanding. For when we put aside the idea we have of ourself, the divine ideas come. One must acquire a spiritual sense in order to have divine enlightenment. This work is crucial in order for people to understand a few things, especially in our times. This is imposed upon us by the circumstances. You see, even back in Asia Minor during those difficult years, conditions forced people to think more. Two Greeks could communicate between themselves in front of Armenians and Turks without the latter understanding anything. There's even more reason for us today, given the conditions we're living under, to have spiritual people who are able to communicate with each other. Difficult years are ahead. Our mind must be in gear. If our mind isn't in gear and there is no divine enlightenment, then in each case one must receive a directive on how to act. Do not expect to be told everything. Some things you must come to understand on your own without being told. I remember once in Konitsa before I went to the army, 
We heard that guerrillas were coming to town. There were four of us. Three were Muslims, and we hid in a Turkish home at the edge of town. A little Turkish boy, five years old he was, understood the situation, told us, Go cook room, I go out. So we went into the kitchen and came out behind the house in time to hide in some storehouse further down. The boy went out and told the gorillas there was no one in the house, and they went away. A little boy, this high, who barely knew how to speak, was able to think and act so wisely. Now he was sharp. You see, he observed the situation, and he had love, whereas an adult could have done harm by being careless and thoughtless. We who have received baptism and chrismation, we who have been instructed in the faith and have studied the faith, must not be stunted in a state of spiritual immaturity. Be sharp-witted. Do you know what the sharp-witted are? And the Greek, exeteria. They are the six-winged cherubim, who have six sets of wings and who flap them as they sing, Agius, 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 Holy, Holy, Holy. Go fly with six sets of wings. Divine enlightenment is everything. I often tell people, arrange matters as God enlightens you. When I say, as God enlightens you, I mean that man must view things with divine enlightenment and not through human rationality. One must not think that whatever makes one feel comfortable is also the enlightenment of God. How does divine enlightenment come to us? If we burnish the wires, the sinful man can become a good conductor, and then the grace of God will be transmitted to provide the divine light of grace. Otherwise, the system is short-circuited, and grace cannot enter. The basic thing is for man to take care not to lose the grace of God, so as to have divine enlightenment, for everything is in vain if there is no divine enlightenment. What difficulties Christ had with his earthly disciples! until they were overshadowed by divine grace. Before Pentecost, authority was given to the disciples to help the people, but they did not yet have the divine enlightenment which they received at Pentecost. When Christ told his disciples that he was going to Jerusalem and the Son of Man was going to be crucified and raised and so forth, they imagined that when he arrived in Jerusalem, the people would raise him up to be king. They were thinking in human terms. This is why they were concerned as to who would sit at the right side or at the left side of Christ. The mother of the sons of Zebedee went to Jesus and asked that he place one of her sons at his right and the other at his left. See Matthew twenty seventeen verse 17 to 21 to continue. But from the day of Pentecost when Christ sent the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, the apostles received divine grace forever. Prior to that, they had divine enlightenment, only on occasion. It was like their batteries were charged, but would run down again. They needed to be plugged into an electrical outlet and be recharged. Again and again, they would run out. Again and again, they needed to be recharged. When the paraclete was sent to the apostles, they no longer needed to be recharged. It's not that, they, it's not that we are now better and they were worse, but rather that we are now living in the time of grace. And this means that we have no excuses. We are baptized. We have the Holy Spirit through chrismation. We have it all. Back then, Christ had not yet been crucified, and in a way the devil still had some authority and could easily mislead people. Following the crucifixion, Christ granted to all the ability to receive divine enlightenment. Christ sacrificed himself and liberated us. We are now baptized in his name. The electrical outlet is now permanently in place. Now it is we who are interrupting the passage of divine grace, and this is because we let the wires get rusty. Yet on the what is required for the Holy Spirit to dwell in man? A fighting spirit, humility, sacrificial love, Philotimo, nobility, and sacrifice are some of the requirements. Man is worthless without the grace of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the light, the divine light.
The whole basis is there. If someone cannot see, he may walk into a window, walk off a cliff or into a ditch. He cannot see where he's going because he lacks the necessary light. But if he sees a small ray of light, he can protect himself. If he sees even more clearly, he can avoid all the dangers and walk safely on his way. And for light to come, one must be willing to come out of the darkness. Even if people see poorly, they will not fall and God will not be displeased. If a father is troubled and worried over his children falling into mud, into thorny bushes, or off a cliff, imagine how much more even God himself is troubled over us. All the evil in the world exists where divine enlightenment is lacking. And when divine enlightenment is lacking, man is in darkness. The one person says, let's go this way. The others say, no, I know better. This is the way we must go. And so it goes. This way, no, that way. Each person thinks it is better to go his way. In other words, they are all interested in going the right way, but they are all in a sort of confusion and cannot come to a mutual understanding. If there were no confusion, they would not be arguing. They would have recognized the best way and would take that direction. I mean to say that everyone may have a good disposition, but given the confusion, many problems are created in society and in the church. At least in the church, most people do not have a bad disposition, but they do lack divine enlightenment. They struggle for the good, but where do they end up? For this reason, we must ask God to grant us even a little divine enlightenment, otherwise we will constantly stumble as if we were blind. In the divine liturgy, when the priest says, we offer to you thine own of thine own, I pray to God that he provide light for the people to see. A small ray of light provided by God can dispel the darkness and keep the people from spiritually crippling themselves in the darkness. During the reading of the second psalm, which St. Arsenios of Cappadocia read as a prayer to God to enlighten those going to conferences, I pray, may God enlighten all the leaders of the world, enlighten all the hierarchs and fathers of the church to receive the Holy Spirit so as to be able to help the people of the world. Even if a single one is enlightened and others become at least receptive, can you imagine what great good could be achieved? One timely word spoken by a leader can make a big difference. People have a need for divine enlightenment. The benevolent God provides his divine enlightenment to those who have good intentions. A judge once related a case which he had encountered personally. A monk was sent by his monastery with 500 gold coins to buy a field. He went to ask a real estate broker who said to him, leave the gold coins with me so you don't have to carry them. So he left the money in with the broker. What a nice man, the monk thought innocently in his heart. He relieved me of that burden. When the monk returned, the broker not only did not give him back the coins, but even claimed that he had given the monk eight million drachmas. The poor monk thought how he would return to the monastery. Not only had he given the 500 coins and received nothing in return, but the broker was demanding an additional 8 million drachmas. The matter ended up in court. At the trial, the judge had the inspiration to ask a series of questions, whose answers not only proved that the broker had not given anything to the monk, but that he had also taken the gold coins. I was able to see that the judge was in a spiritual state similar to that of the prophet Daniel. As he had had the fear of God in his heart, God illumined him to act appropriately and uphold justice. The whole basis is divine enlightenment. When divine enlightenment comes, then not only are the person and his environment at peace and at ease, but he himself can continue to make spiritual progress. This is why I keep saying that while the lights and the chandeliers, these impressive discoveries of the mind are nice and useful, the divine light of the grace of God, which enlightens man, is superior. The person who has divine enlightenment can see things very clearly. He is well informed without doubts and can positively help others without becoming weary. Part 2. Struggle and Devoutness 
One who is heedful and takes the salvation of his soul seriously, struggles, progresses, bears fruit, is nourished spiritually, and rejoices angelically. Chapter 1. The Good Fight. 1 Timothy 6.12 The Struggle to Sanctify the Soul My heart rejoices when I see souls who take heed and struggle in a world that has become full of little devils. Our benevolent and righteous God has bestowed upon us, all of us the proper gifts. For example, manliness upon men and tenderness upon women. So we may struggle and thus climb the spiritual ladder with the help of divine grace and come ever closer to him who is our creator. We must never forget that beside us, apart from people who can help us spiritually, we also have Christ himself, Panagia, the Cherubim and the Seraphim, and all the saints. Take courage then. Christ is mighty. He is almighty and will provide his divine power for us to break the power of the evil one. Ever present and invisible, he watches over us constantly and will strengthen us whenever we struggle humbly with a good will. We must as far as possible avoid the causes of sin. We must guard our senses because it all starts from there. And if this is sometimes or even often difficult, let us at least steer away from curiosity. That is, not allow our eyes <clears throat> to take in sinful images through which the devil tempts us by replaying them as a cinema in our mind. If we grasp a small piece of burning coal, it will burn us. But if we roll it around in our palm for a few moments, then it won't. It is the same with sinful images. Our eyes cannot hold them when they pass by quickly, for they are simply fleeting images that cannot burn the soul. Let those who are heedless and who have acquired bad habits while living a worldly life accept uncomplainingly the war the enemy will wage against them once they have changed their ways. They must do this, however, without cultivating any evil desires. If they work hard at this, they will be purified and reach the level of pure people who have never known great sins, learned bad habits, or been sorely tempted. Also, if they learn from their previous failings, they will make great progress. If someone has to walk through a minefield and is not familiar with the terrain, he will need to proceed with caution, otherwise he will be blown up. If, however, he is familiar with the territory, he may indeed suffer some wounds, but with the experience he already has, he will be able to advance steadily and quickly. If one is to work on one's follow soul, one must first weed out all the thorns, its passions, and then plant virtues in their place. However, this process is an arduous one, requires a strong will and great patience. Yeranda, can you please tell us in a practical terms how this work is done? Every day you should try to plant in your soul something spiritual, which will eject something worldly and sinful. Gradually, the old self will be disclaimed, and you will be able to move freely in the spiritual realm. Replace the sinful images in your mind with holy ones. Replace songs with hymns, worldly magazines with spiritual books. If you do not break away from all that is worldly and sinful, if you do not commune with Christ, with Panagia, with the saints, with the church triumphant, and if you do not place yourself completely in the hands of God, you will not be able to acquire spiritual health. Yet under what is spiritual health? Spiritual health equals pure thoughts, an enlightened mind, and a purified heart that unceasingly harbors Christ and Panagia. Watchfulness, nipsis, over ourselves, and prayer are a great help in acquiring spiritual health. Prayer is essential for the purification of the soul, and prudence is essential for the preservation of a healthy spiritual condition. Life, of course, is no summer camp. It has joys, but also sorrows. The resurrection is always preceded by the crucifixion. The blows of life's trials are essentially for the salvation of the soul for the soul is refined through them. Just as with clothes, the more we rub them in the wash, the cleaner they become. Even with the octopus, the more it is beaten, the more it is 
cleaned and tenderized. And the fish, too, appear so graceful when alive and swimming in the sea, or even when displayed in the market with the scales and entrails intact. But it becomes useful only once it is cleaned and made to look less appetizing on the outside before it is broiled. It is much the same with people. When a person sheds all things secular, his scales, if you will, it may seem that he is losing life, his worldly liveliness, but in fact, he is merely removing all useless matter in order to be broiled. Only then is he made useful. What helps spiritual progress? People who have been buffeted by rough winds, either because God allowed it in order to rein them in, or because of the devil's envy, are in need of much sunshine and spiritual refreshment before they can blossom and bear fruit. They are like trees that have grown bold during winter's halicorn days, only to face the cold wind, the cold north wind afterwards. They will need constant spring sunshine and showers for their sap to circulate again and to blossom and bear fruit. Yet under what must one do to make this spiritual turnaround? It takes a philotomo-filled effort with hope and trust in God. Trust in God, simplicity, and struggle with philotomo will lead to inner peace and security, and then the soul fills with hope and joy. For the athlete to be crowned with victory takes patience, philotomo, and spiritual bravery. Bravery stems from a heart filled with philotomo, and when one does something with his heart for Christ, he neither tires nor feels pain, because such suffering for Christ is a spiritual feast. Spiritual progress can be rapid with a little philotimo, filled effort, and awareness of our inner self. In the meantime, the soul will be befriended by Jesus Christ, befriended by Panagia, the angels and the saints. Study, prayer, introversion, and some peace and tranquility help a lot, too. Christ helps those who are fighting the good fight that all the saints embraced in order to subdue the flesh to the spirit. Even when wounded, we must never lose our composure, but should instead ask of, for God's help in continuing with the struggle courageously. The good shepherd will hear us and rush to our aid, just as a shepherd responds to the bleeding of a lamb that is lost or wounded or threatened by a wolf. I constantly think of those who lived a wretched life and are now struggling. I love and cherish them more than those who do not suffer from passions. Even a shepherd will be more compassionate with the injured or sickly sheep and will give it more attentive care until it gets back on its feet again. If again we struggle aright but do not see any progress, sometimes the following is happening. Because we have declared war on a demon, he seeks reinforcements from Satan. Footnote. <clears throat> Oh, the footnote, the most common name is in sacred scriptures, Satan and ecclesiastical literature denoting the leader of the fallen and benevolent spirits. To continue, so if last year we were struggling against one demon, this year we're struggling against 50. Next year we'll be struggling against even more, and so forth. God does not allow us to see this, so as we don't become proud. But even though we may not realize this, God continues to work in our soul and when he sees our good disposition. Yet under what is wrong when someone struggles but really makes no spiritual progress? He may be proud of his struggle, but let me tell you what causes some people not to progress. While they have excellent potential, they squander their energy on insignificant things, and this drains them of their spirit strength required for the spiritual struggle. Let us imagine, for example, that we set out to attack the enemy and prepare ourselves with all necessary weapons to confront him. He, however, fearing defeat, attempts to distract us and draws our attention elsewhere through sabotage and diversionary attacks. We then turn our attention to these attacks. We waste our energy right and left. Time passes. Munitions and supplies diminish. We provide our soldiers with old, worn-out clothing and they begin to grumble. The end result is that all our energy is used up and we do not really confront the enemy. This is what happens to some in their spiritual struggle. Yet on the don't one's surroundings help in the spiritual struggle? 
Yes, they do. But sometimes one can live among saints and still make no progress. Was there ever a better opportunity than given to Judas, who was always with Christ? Judas had neither humility nor a good disposition. Even after the betrayal, he did not humble himself, throwing the silver coins down with anger and pride. He hanged himself in sin. The Pharisees also acted like the devil. When they had accomplished their evil work, they told Judas, See to it yourself. Matthew 27, verse 3 to 5. God acts according to the inner condition of man. The Holy Spirit is not obstructed by anything. What I have learned is that no matter where someone may find himself, if he struggles with Philotimo, he can achieve the desired goal, the salvation of his soul. Even Lot, who lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, had attained an impressive spiritual condition. Now, whether we want it or not, we must struggle for our improvement so that divine grace may be active in us. Real events compel us and will continue to compel us to approach God all the more so as to have divine power to confront every situation aright and effectively. And naturally, the benevolent God will not neglect us. He will protect us. In any case, we must know that when we improve our spiritual condition, not only do we feel much better, but Christ too is pleased. Can anyone imagine the great joy experienced by Christ when he sees his children advancing? I pray that all men and women may achieve spiritual progress and be united with Christ, who is the Alpha and the Omega. When all of our life is dependent upon him, then all things are sanctified. Spiritual study. Yet under what books should we read by those who are beginning their spiritual search? First, they should read the New Testament to learn the meaning of Christ, to be shaken up a little. Later, they can read the Old Testament. Do you know how hard it is when they have read nothing and yet they come to ask for help? It's like an elementary school child going to a university professor and saying, help me. What can the professor tell him? One plus one equals two. Others, again, are not spiritually restless. They come and say, Father, I have no problems and I'm just fine. I only dropped by to see you. Man can never say that he has no problems, no concerns. He will have something. The struggle for the spiritual life never ends. Or some people come and tell me, tell us spiritual things. It is as if they went to the grocery store and said, give us some groceries. The grocer is at a loss and needs to know what they need. They need to say, I want so much sugar, so much rice, and so on but they only say, give us groceries. It's like going to the pharmacy and saying, hey, give us medicines, without first saying what their illness is or whether or not they went to the doctor and what he advised them to do and so on. Go figure. You see, whoever is seriously concerned over his spiritual condition knows more or less what he is lacking. And once he seeks it, he benefits. As a novice, when I read something I liked, I wrote it down so as not to forget it, and I would try to apply it in my life. I didn't just read to pass my time pleasantly. I had a spiritual restlessness, and when I could not understand something, I'd ask for an explanation. I read relatively little, but I checked myself a great deal on what I read. What point am I at? What must I do? I would sit myself down and go through such a self-examination. I do not allow what I read to pass by me untaxed. Today, with so much reading, people end up like tape recorders, filling up their cassettes with superfluous matters. According to Abba Isaac, however, wisdom not based on righteous activity is a deposit of disgrace. Sadako Homily 1. You see, many who are interested in sports read sport magazines and newspapers while they are sitting. They may be like the fatted calf, but they still marvel at the athletes. Oh, he is so marvelous. He is great. Bravo. But they don't work up any sweat, and they don't lose any pounds. They read and read about athletic events, and then they go and lie down. They gain nothing. They are satisfied with the pleasure of reading. Some worldly people read newspapers, other romantic literature, 
or an adventure novel. Still others watch a football game at the stadium and pass their time. The same thing is done by some people who read spiritual books. They may spend the whole night reading spiritual books with great intensity and be content. They take a spiritual book, sit comfortably, begin reading. Oh, I profited from that, they say. It would be better to say, I enjoyed myself, I spent my time pleasantly. But this is not profit. We profit when we understand what we read, when we censure ourselves and discipline ourselves by applying it. What does this mean? Where do I stand in relation to this spiritual truth? What must I do now? After all, the more we learn, the more responsibility we have to live up to what we've learned. I am not saying that we should not read so that we can plead ignorance and therefore be free of responsibility, for this is a cunning deception. I am saying that we should not read merely to pass our time pleasantly. The bad thing is that if someone reads a lot and has a strong memory, he may remember many things and may even talk a lot about what he has read and thus deceive himself into thinking that he also personally observes the many things he reads. So he has created an illusion toward himself and others. So don't be comforted by the thought that you read a lot. Instead, turn your attention to applying what you've read. Much reading alone will only educate you encyclopedically. Isn't that what they call it? Yes, Yeranda. The goal, however, is to be transformed in a God-centered manner. I'm not aiming to be a university professor where I would need to know many things, but if I ever need something from this worldly knowledge, I can easily learn it once I have acquired the God-centered knowledge. Do you see what I mean? When one has a distraction... It is beneficial to concentrate through study. Yes, one should read a little, something very demanding in order to warm up the soul. This keeps distractions and concerns under the lid, and the mind is transposed into a divine realm. Otherwise, the mind is diverted by whatever task is preoccupying it. Yeronda, when someone is tired or upset, he usually wants to read something light and easy, a short story or a novel, perhaps... Or something like that. Is there no spiritual book that is appropriate for such times? The purpose is not to forget one's worry, but to be redeemed. Such light reading does not redeem. Novels, newspapers, and television have no value in developing a spiritual life. Quite often, even some religious periodicals are damaging to Christians because they stir a foolish zealousness that leads to confusion. Take care. Do not read unnecessary things during your free time. Some reading matter is completely hollow, like a water pumpkin. It is like looking in a haystack to find a kernel of wheat. Some people say, yes, but they relax me. But how can they be relaxing, my good man, if they make you dizzy and cause your eyes to ache? It is better to rest by sleeping. You can learn much about a person's spiritual state from what he reads. One who is very worldly will probably be reading indecent magazines. One who is less worldly will read less indecent magazines and newspapers. One who is religious will read religious periodicals or contemporary religious books or patristic texts and so on. Yet under which spiritual books are the most helpful? The various patristic texts, which, thank God, are, are available by the thousands today and are very helpful. One can find whatever one needs and desires in these books. They are authentic spiritual nourishment and a sure guide on the spiritual path. However, in order to be of benefit to us, they have to be read with humility and prayer. Patristic texts reveal the inner spiritual condition of the soul, much as axial tomography reveals the inner structures of the body. Each sentence of the patristic texts contains a multitude of meanings, and each person can interpret them according to their own spiritual state of being. It is better to read the ancient text rather than a translation, because the translator interprets the original verse according to his own spirituality. In any case, in order to understand the writings of the fathers, one must constrain oneself, focus, and live spiritually, for the spirit of the fathers is perceived through and by the spirit only. 
especially helpful are the ascetical homilies by St. Isaac the Syrian, but they must be studied slowly so they can be assimilated little by little as spiritual food. The Evangetinos, footnote, a familiar anthology of ascetic and patristic sayings and incidents, which were compiled by the monk Paul, the Evangetinos, the founder of the famous holy monastery of the Theotokos Benefactress in Constantinople. To continue, the Evangetinos is truly of great benefit because it gives us insight into the whole spirit of the fathers. It is helpful because it describes the struggles of the Holy Fathers against each and every one of the passions. And by learning how they worked on the spiritual life, the soul is greatly assisted. Also, the Sanaxarian, the lives of the saints, are sacred history and very helpful, especially for young people, but they should not be read as stories. We do not need great knowledge to be devout. If we concentrate and meditate on the few things we know, our heart will be spiritually embroidered. One may be profoundly affected by a single hymn, while another may feel nothing, even though he may know all the hymns by heart, as he has not entered into the spiritual reality. So, read the Fathers, even one or two lines a day. They are very strengthening vitamins for the soul. The True Worshippers, John 4.23 Some people will say, in this small and peaceful church, I can really experience the divine liturgy. In a huge cathedral, I cannot. If I am in a simple whitewashed country chapel, I feel nothing. But if it has frescoes and a beautiful iconostasis, that's where I can truly experience the divine liturgy. Such things are for a person who has no appetite and who needs a little salt, a little pepper to wet his appetite. So, Yaranda, do you mean that such things play no role and don't help in our worship? I'm not saying they don't. They do help, but we must not get caught up with such things. Otherwise, people will be looking to experience God only in a contrived manner. They will seek a darkened monastic cell, a vigil oil lamp with a very dim light, a beautiful and inspirational church. Without them, they will not be able to pray. But for one who is praying, it should make no difference if he is on the train or in the cave or on the road. It should be the same for him. God has made each one of us into a small temple, and we can always have it with us wherever we go. Everybody is seeking peace of mind, but this comes from within. Those poor people who go from one shrine to another seeking to find Christ do not realize that he is always near them. And while they could could find him without effort, they weary themselves with pointless journeys and still don't find him. A truly spiritual person does not find peace of mind by wandering around to see various places of interest. This is for those who are suffering, who need to leave their worries behind. A spiritual person who finds divine consolation in his faith does not need this, and if he does not have this divine consolation, then he is no different from a worldly person. His perspective and his interests will still be worldly. They will not be spiritual. He will still be seeking peace of mind in something worldly. Many come to the holy mountain, visit various fathers, become enthused with what they hear from each, interpret them in their own way, muddle them up in their heads, and then say, we had a really good time. Whereas if they had visited only one father, heeded his advice, and tried to apply it, all that he had said to their life, they would have some positive help. Now what they are doing is spiritual tourism. They're wasting their time, exhausting themselves without gaining anything. How restful and beneficial it would be if they stayed with one father and applied what he told them. They could experience the soul's inner repose, whereas now they wander from place to place, enjoying the holy mountain's beautiful green landscape, just like worldly people do. There are also some others who say, I will go to this Panagia or that Panagia. There's only one Panagia. They make trips to these shrines not so much out of reverence, but as an opportunity to go on a trip. From that alone, you can realize that these people have no peace of mind. If someone does not have some reverence, a sense of humility, you could place him in the Holy Sepulchre itself. He wouldn't see anything. But if he is truly pious, 
he could see the holy light even on Golgotha. Once a novice from the holy monastery of St. Savas was sent on Holy Saturday to receive the holy light from the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem for his monastery. It was customary for the surrounding monasteries to send monks to receive the holy light. This particular novice did something cunning. Using his monastic cassock, he pushed to the front of the queue ahead of the lay pilgrims. A while later, some clerics came to the front, and the novice was asked to stand aside, because it had already been determined who would stand where. Then the novice began to scold himself. You miserable and disgraceful sinner, how dare you push your worthless self to the front? Get out of here at once. You are not even worthy to stay in the church. He truly believed all of this, he was saying to himself, and exited the church, beseeching Christ. Oh, my Lord Jesus Christ, please let me go to some other shrine at least. And he went further up to the shrine of Golgotha. Once there, he began denouncing himself again. How could I, a worthless novice, do such a cunning and wretched thing? Take the place of those pious pilgrims who are better than me. And as he was deploring himself, a strong light appeared suddenly like lightning out of Holy Golgotha, broke him down. Then the poor novice said to himself, The holy light has descended. He went humbly with his little lamp to receive the holy light and returned quietly to his monastery. Yet, do you mean to say that the pilgrimages made, for example, to the Holy Land do not help? Look, let me explain. Today, if you set out to receive some benefit, you have to endure a lot of harm in the trains, the airplanes, the hotels. Everything has been secularized. What would you profit if you went into a spiritual environment and experienced a massive worldly disarray? One must be very strong to be able to utilize everything for the best. And another thing, the person who greets and guides the visitors at the various shrines would do better sometimes not to speak at all. They do not speak with reverence. For example, this is Gethsemane, here's the Holy Sepulchre, and so on. They rattle off very quickly. Here's this, here's that. Now we're going to Bethlehem, where the Magi from Persia came from. And before they know it, the tourists are in Kuwait. But this doesn't allow one who has read Holy Scripture and knows that this is the Holy Sepulchre. There is Gethsemane to meditate and pray. The tourist guides are needed for those who have not read Holy Scripture, but those who go on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land have all read Holy Scripture. So instead of helping them, they confuse the people all the more. Meanwhile, they, they go so quickly from one shrine to the other that people have no chance to take in what they hear. It is entirely different when people go on such pilgrimages in spiritual company and with a spiritual guide and the necessary preparation. A woman from Farasa, who now lives in Yanitsa, used to say of these modern pilgrims, Can they be real hajis, pilgrims? In half an hour they go to Jerusalem, and in half an hour they're back. Can they be hajis? In the old days, the poor pilgrims would stay at the shrines and attend vigils in order to benefit themselves spiritually, but also to avoid the cost of lodging so they could give the money to charity. And if anyone who went on a pilgrimage and returned to the village without some spiritual edification, people would say, you were garlic when you went, and you returned an onion. St. Arsenios would go to Jerusalem every ten years, walking five days to Marcina to take the boat. Today it would be rare to find such cases. I remember a Russian who had come to my hut from Vladivostokov, a city across from Japan. He had made a vow to go to the Holy Land on foot. When he went to his bishop to receive a blessing for this pilgrimage, the bishop said, You're crazy. You can't possibly go on foot. He then went to the monastery of Zagorsk, in Moscow and received a blessing from a starets there. He embarked on his pilgrimage at Pascha, arrived in Jerusalem in October. He walked 70 kilometers each day. Later, he also came to the Holy Mountain on foot and was planning another trip to Jerusalem. He had real divine love. He lived in another world. 
He knew a little Greek and he would com- we would communicate a little. He told me, I thought the Antichrist would be there so I could bear witness and become a martyr, but he wasn't. When I go again to Jerusalem, I will make a prostration at the Holy Sepulchre for you as well, and you can pray for me. He got up, did a great matanya to the ground to show me how he does it, hitting his head on a rock. You could see a fire in his soul. Others who just go to the Holy Land for tourism with no reverence would do better not to go. How profound is the presence of Christ in the Holy Land. On the road to Golgotha, one can feel a transformation taking place. Even if someone does not know where he is going, merely walking there is enough to be profoundly moved. There is a sign in Latin which says, Via Doloroso, meaning the way of suffering. And at the Holy Sepulchre, one can see all types of people. Some are clergy, others lay people. Some are dressed decently, others not. Some are wearing long clothes, others short, and still others almost none at all. Some have short hair, others long. Different people, different styles, different races, from different doctrinal denominations. Some are Roman Catholics, others Armenians, but they all go to venerate there. This really made an impression on me. It is very inspiring, an emotional experience. But one must study all these things with good and positive thoughts in order to be inspired and edified spiritually. Yet if someone has no desire to go to the Holy Land, is it an indication that he lacks reverence and devoutness? No. I myself have not gone to all the monasteries of the Holy Mountain or even to the many of the shrines. I have not visited the shrine of St. John the Russian, for example, but this does not mean that I do not revere the saint. It is good to revere a saint in some shrine, but we need not run to go there. We should go when an opportunity arises or when there is some reason. What really matters is what Christ said to the Samaritan woman, the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. The Salvation of Our Soul Yeronda, some feel certain of their salvation and others have doubts. What is the proper stance? The goal is for people to observe God's commandments. The spiritual person must attain such a spiritual condition that even if God does not grant him paradise, he will not be disturbed. We must realize well that today we are alive, tomorrow we may be gone, and we must be concerned how to be near Christ. Those who have by God's grace realized the vanity of this life have actually received the greatest gift. It is not necessary to be able to foresee the future, for it is enough to have the foresight to prepare for the salvation of the soul and to take the best possible spiritual measures to be saved. You see, Christ did say, the value of one soul is greater than the whole world, Matthew 16, 26. The value of one soul is infinite, This is why the salvation of one soul is an extremely important matter. Does this mean, Yaranda, that one shouldn't have the hope of salvation and the fear of damnation? If someone has the hope of salvation, he will not have the fear of damnation. And for someone to have the hope of salvation, he will have to be somewhat sorted out. The person who is struggling to the best of his abilities, who has no desire to live a disorderly life, but who in the course of the struggle for faith and life falls and rises again and again, God will never abandon. And if he has the slightest will not to grieve God, he will go to paradise with his shoes on. The benevolent God will surprisingly push him into paradise. God will ensure he takes him when he is at his best in repentance. He may have to struggle all his life But God will not abandon him. He will take him at the best possible time. God is kind. He wants all of us to be saved. 1 Timothy 2.4 If only a few were to be saved, why then was Christ crucified? The gate into paradise is not narrow. There is room for all those who bow humbly and are not puffed up with pride as long as they repent and give the burden of their sins to Christ then there's plenty of room to pass through the gate. 
We also have the excuse that we are earthen vessels. We are not purely spirit like the angels. But we are inexcusable when we do not repent and do not approach our Savior humbly. The thief on the cross simply said, forgive me, and he was saved. Salvation depends on the second, not the minute. Man can be saved with a single humble thought or with a proud one lose everything. We should be saved for the sake of Philotimo itself. There is no greater pain for God than to see man in hell. I think that gratitude for God's many blessings and a humble demeanor with love toward his images, our fellow human beings, together with a Philotimo-filled struggle, are enough to keep our soul at peace in this life and the next. Part 2, Struggle and Devoutness, Continued, Chapter 2, How the Devil Works. The devil seeks to disable the spiritual warrior. Yet under sometimes the temptations come one after another, and I can't stand it. If I give you a solution to avoid them, will you accept it? Yes. The only way to avoid temptations is to make an alliance with the devil. Why are you smiling? You don't like this solution? Look, let me explain. As long as someone is struggling, there will be temptations and difficulties. And the more one tries to avoid temptation, the more contrary the devil becomes. But through temptations, if we use them correctly, we are given the opportunity to make our life, which sometimes is anti-evangelical, evangelical. Yeronda, I get bogged down in unimportant things, and then I have no energy to struggle for something more spiritual. That is like the mines positioned by the enemy to neutralize the army. The devil, when he realizes that he cannot do any other harm to the spiritual warrior, will try to disable him with unimportant things. Also, you should know that there are many other little devils who do great harm. One, once, one such little devil was asked, What harm could you possibly do? And he replied, What can I do? I go and tangle the strings of the seamstresses, of the cobblers, and cause them to become angry. The biggest scandals are caused by unimportant things, not just between people, but sometimes between nations as well. Spiritual people have no serious occasions for scandals, for there the devil finds opportunities for minor things. He can break the spirit of a spiritual person through foolish, childish matters, rendering his heart as he wants it, useless and incapable of real spiritual struggle. Why is it, Yananda, that I start off my struggle methodically and with enthusiasm, but soon neglect it? Don't you know? The devil, as soon as he realizes that we are doing spiritual work, turns the switch on to something else. While we set ourselves a certain rule, we find ourselves doing something else. And if we are not paying attention, we don't realize this for days. This is why the fighter must always go contrary to the devil. With discernment, of course, and be guided by an experienced spiritual father. Does the devil attack a person who is not involved in refined spiritual work? Satan won't go to a useless person. He'll go to a fighter in order to tempt and disable him. He won't waste time working out cunning temptations on someone who is not involved in refined spiritual work. To one sewing with a sack needle, he sends a devil with a sack needle. To one who is doing very fine needlework, he sends a devil to do very fine work. To those who are doing coarse spiritual work on themselves, he sends a boorish devil. To the beginners, he sends an inexperienced devil. These sensitive people who have a refined soul and a great sense of philotimo need to be careful because the devil gets involved to make them even more sensitive to the point of melancholy or even, God forbid, suicide. While the devil makes us humans turn against one another and argue, he himself never turns contrary. Those who are careless and neglectful, he makes even more careless and neglectful, putting them at ease with the thought, you have a headache, you are not well, it doesn't matter if you don't get up for prayer. Those who are pious, he makes even more pious, 
to trick them into the sin of pride or to push them to struggle beyond their strength and become so weary that they abandon all their spiritual weapons, thus causing former fighters to surrender altogether. The devil makes hard-hearted people more hard-hearted and the sensitive hypersensitive. And you can see how many people are suffering, some because they are sensitive and others because they have had a nervous breakdown and are troubled with sleeplessness and need to take many pills. Or they are in some other way tormented and wasting away in some hospital. It is quite rare today to find a well-balanced person. People have become like batteries. Most of them seem to have electricity, especially those who do not go to confession are subject to demonic attacks. They seem to have a demonic magnetism because the devil has authority over them. Few people, no matter whether they are boys or girls or adults, have a calm and serene look. Possession. Do you know what possession means? Not being able to communicate with other people. The devil gives us an injection of anesthesia. Once I told some doctors who were discussing the anesthesia they use in operations. The anesthesia of temptation is harmful to man, but the one you use is very helpful. The devil's anesthesia is like the poison certain snakes use to paralyze small birds and young rabbits so they can swallow them whole before they have a chance to react. When the devil wants to attack a person, he first sends an assistant, little devil, an anesthesiologist, in order to desensitize him, and then the devil himself takes over and starts pounding. But first the anesthesiologist has to do his work. He gives us an injection of anesthesia, and we forget. Even we monks who have vowed to be reviled, to be mocked, are sometimes entangled by temptations and end up doing exactly the opposite of what we have vowed. We start out in one direction and end up somewhere else. We are not careful. Have I not told you of such examples? In the old days, there was no bank in Konitsa. People had to go to Yanena if they needed to take out a loan. So some people would start out from the nearby villages to walk 72 kilometers just to get a loan to buy, for example, a horse. In those days, having a horse was enough to provide for your family. They would join their horse with a neighbor's and would plow together. A long time ago, a man went to Yenena in order to get a loan for a plow horse so that he wouldn't struggle with the, the hand hoe. He went to the bank, got his loan, then went to the Jewish shops to look around. The merchants saw him looking around and tried to draw him into their shops. Come in, my good man, I have plenty of good merchandise. The man would enter the shop, and the merchant would take down various bolts of fabric from the shelves for him to see. The merchant would unravel the bolt and praise the quality of the cloth. Take it. It is good quality. For the sake of your children, I will sell it to you for less. The villager continued to look around from shop to shop. Come in, my good man. I will sell it to you for less. Again, same routine. The merchant would take the bolts down, unravel them, and spread them out before the overwhelmed vill villager. In the end, the poor man was very confused and gave in. He was a simple yet honorable man. Well, he thought to himself, the merchant did take all these bolts down and promised to sell the fabric for less for the sake of my children. So he gave the loan money to buy a bolt of fabric, which wasn't even new. What would he do with so much fabric? Even a rich man wouldn't buy so much. He'd buy only as much as he needed. He returned home with a bolt of rotted fabric. Where's the horse? He was asked. I brought fabric for the children, he replied. But what can they do with so much fabric? He was now in debt to the bank. He had no horse, and the cloth he bought had rotted from sitting on the shelves for ages. So he was once again forced to hoe the fields by hand to pay off the debt. If he had bought a horse as he had originally planned, he would have had ridden home rather than walked with a few things for the house, and most importantly, he would not need to work the fields with the hand hoe. 
Do you see what happened to him when he allowed himself to be distracted at the shops? This is what the devil does. Like the cunning merchant, he draws you here and there, and he tricks you into going wherever he wants you to go. You can start off in one direction and end up in another if you are not careful. The devil can outwit you and make you squander your best years. The devil will do anything to prevent man from benefiting. The devil is quite the craftsman. For example, if he brings a miserable thought to a spiritual person during the divine liturgy, that person will recognize the deception and reject the thought. So the devil will suggest a spiritual thought. That particular book has a lot of information about the divine liturgy. If that won't work, the devil will distract the man by making him look at the chandelier, let's say. And absentmindedly, the man will start wondering who might have made the chandelier. Or he might remind him of some sick person that he had to go and visit. Oh, an inspiration during the divine liturgy, he thinks, when all along it is the devil who intervenes, causing the man to dwell on his thoughts. Then all of a sudden he hears the priest saying, with the fear of God, with faith and love, draw nigh, and realizes the divine liturgy is almost over and he did not really participate in it at all. This happens even right here in the church. The appointed nun goes to light the candles on the large central chandelier, the palielos. And I have seen how even adults are distracted when they turn to see how the nun lights the candles. This is such a childish thing. Only very young children get excited about such things and say, look, she lit the candles. This is understandable for young children, but for adults, what can you say? Or when we are supposed to avoid moving about in the church during the divine liturgy, Temptation can move a nun during this sacred time to turn the pages of a book on the lectern and start distracting others with the motion and the sound. So they hear the rustling sound and their mind starts to wander. And yet that is how the mind is distracted from God, and the devil rejoices. For this reason, we should not be the source of distraction to others during the sacred time of worship. We harm people without realizing it. Or you may notice how during a particular reading, when the reader is about to read an important line in the text, one which could benefit the people, a door will bang in the wind or someone will cough, distracting the congregation's attention and depriving them of the spiritual benefit of the sacred text. This is how the devil does his work. Oh, if you could only see how the devil moves about to do his work. You have not seen him. And this is why you do not understand certain things. He'll do anything to prevent man from benefiting. I have observed this at my hut when I have had conversations with visitors. Just as I reach a crucial point, precisely when I am about to say something important to help my listeners, there will be noise or someone will arrive and interrupt. The devil will have previously diverted their attention upon the skeedy from afar or have them look at something that will motivate them to arrive at that moment in conversation that will force me to change the subject and prevent the others from benefiting. When the conversation begins, the devil knows where it will lead, and seeing that he will be overcome, he sends someone at the critical moment to interrupt us. Hello, Father, where's the entrance? he shouts. And I shout back, take some sweet and water and come that way. Others come in at that time and interrupt me as I have to get up and greet them. After a while, still others come, and again I have to get up, and then they begin to chit-chat of light conversations. Where are you from? Etc. and so on. Then I'm forced to start all over again in relating the example I had started on. As I proceed, someone else will call out from below, Hello, Father Paisios, where are you? Is this the way to come to you? So once again, you need to get up, and the temptation goes on and on. One day, I had six or seven such interruptions, and I was forced to play some guards. You stay guard there and watch for anyone coming from that point. You stay close by here until I finish my work. Imagine starting a conversation six or seven times only to be interrupted the moment you get to the point of bringing benefit to someone. That's what the little devils do. See what temptation can do? 
it can turn the switch back and forth from one frequency to another. Just as a fighter is about to receive a message and benefit from it, the dial is switched to another frequency and the person is distracted by something else. Does he think of something spiritual again? Right away the dial is switched to other thoughts and man is never left at peace to focus. If man could only learn the devil's ways, he would be spared a great deal of trouble. Yaranda, how can one learn? By observing. If one observes, one can learn. Look at the shepherds. They're the best weathermen because they observe the clouds and the winds. The Wing of Will People can easily be influenced both for good or ill. They are influenced more readily toward evil because it is the devil who is prompting them. For example, tell someone to quit smoking because it's harmful. As soon as he decides to stop, the devil will run to tempt him. This type of cigarette has less nicotine. That type has a filter that purifies the smoke. Smoke these, they won't harm you. The devil will find an excuse for him not to quit smoking. He will find a solution. For the devil is capable of finding many excuses, and the cigarette he suggests may be even more harmful. This is why we must be able to exercise our will. For if someone does not cut out his bad habits when he is young, then it will be very difficult later in life when the will is weakened. If a person has no willpower, he can do nothing. St. John Chrysostom says, All depends on being willing or unwilling. St. John Chrysostom's commentary on the first letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians, homily 5. To continue, This is an important matter. God is by nature benevolent and always desires our good. But it is essential that we too be willing, for man flies spiritually with two wings, God's will and his own. One wing, God's own will, he has attached permanently to one of our shoulders. But in order to fly spiritually, we also have to attach our own wing, the human will, to the other shoulder. When someone has a strong will, when he has the human wing, the one which balances the divine wing, then he can't fly. But if his will is weak and has not matured, when he tries to fly a little, he merely tumbles. He tries again to take off, but he still tumbles. Can the will be cultivated and strengthened? Haven't we already said that everything can be cultivated? The will exists in all people in varying degrees. When a person has the desire to struggle, he prays and asks God to increase his will, and God helps. When a person does not progress in the spiritual life, he should know that this is because he either does not contribute any will or his will is insufficient or too weak, in which case it's of no help. A bird, for example, has one strong wing but neglects the other. It loses some feathers and then it cannot fly right. One wing works well, but the other is like a broken comb. The bird flaps it, but the wind passes through it and the bird cannot fly right. It flies a bit, then falls down. It must have both wings intact in order to be able to fly. What I'm trying to say is that man, too, must be careful not to neglect the human will if he wants to fly securely and properly, that is, spiritually. Do you know what the devil does? He slowly creeps up and little by little plucks some small feather from the human wing, and then another, a larger one. And if man is not careful... The devil can even pluck a large feather and make him unable to fly. And if several feathers are plucked, then when he tries to fly, air passes through the plucked wing, and so he rolls over instead of flying. The divine wing is always full and complete. There are no missing feathers, because the devil cannot pluck them out. It is a divine wing. Man must be careful not to be negligent and allow the devil to remove any of the feathers from his own wing. When laziness and indifference creep in, willpower is eventually weakened. What can God do if man is not willing? God does not wish to interfere because he has respect for human freedom. So an unwilling person renders useless even the wing of God. But when man has the will, that is when he has his own wing intact, and God is also willing, then with both wings in place, man can fly. 
Yeronda, what is exactly is this flying you're talking about? Does it mean that I should want to make spiritual progress to desire my salvation? Yes, my child. When I talk about flying, I mean our spiritual ascent toward heaven, not about flying onto some cypress tree. Yananda, you had said once that a person can plow, sow, and do all the necessary work, but may not even harvest enough to cover the cost of the seed. Yes, that's right. If he is not careful, the devil can rob him of all his efforts. One who is heedful and takes the salvation of his soul seriously struggles, progresses, bears fruit, is nourished spiritually, and rejoices angelically. Chapter 3. The Benefits of Good Fellowship. Brotherhood. Yaranda, I am troubled when you say we will go through difficult years. You must love one another, be at peace with one another, train yourselves spiritually, be brave, remain united as one body, and fear nothing. God will help. Cultivate love, the spiritual kind. Love one another like a mother loves her child. You should have a sense of brotherhood and a spirit of sacrifice. Soon we will go through difficult days. Naturally, we monks and nuns leave this world and abandon relatives and friends in order to enter the large family of Adam, God's family. But for the laity who live in society, it is important that they maintain relationships with relatives and friends who live a spiritual life so that they will be helped. The Christian who is struggling in the world is helped when he has relationships with spiritual people. No matter how spiritually one lives, one needs, especially in our present time, good fellowship with others. Contact with spiritual people is most beneficial, even more so than spiritual study, because the joy of this spiritual relationship provides a great impetus to one who struggles spiritually. Even at work, in a government department, for example, it is good to get to know other spiritual people for mutual assistance. A problem, say, could arise among colleagues and mutual support would be helpful, but they may hesitate to speak to one another unless they have already established a fellowship. Yet under when someone refuses to help us in some need, is it right for us to hesitate to ask him again for something we may need? No, you should not hesitate to ask again. Perhaps he did not have the ability to help at that time. It is like you asking me for a small cross and I give it to you. You ask me again at another time, but I do not have any to give you. Later on, I go and buy little crosses so that I can give them out to people. And you come along and do not ask one for me while I am looking for an opportunity to give them out. Today, people can be living in the same apartment building and not know each other. In the past, there was the neighborhood that allowed people to get acquainted and help each other in a time of need. Someone might be traveling with his horse and cart and meet an acquaintance on the road. Where are you coming from? Where are you going? They might ask each other, I'm going there too. Come on, we'll go together. Or maybe if someone else has planned to go somewhere on his horse, he could tell his neighbor, where do you need to go? If you can wait, I'll be going there in three hours by horse and I can take you with me. Or he might say to a neighbor, Tomorrow I will be going that way. Why don't you stay overnight with us and we can leave together early in the morning? People thought of each other and whenever they could offer some help they did, they were curious in a good way and would ask if they could be of help in any situation whatsoever. They even had acquaintances from village to village. Yananda, how does it help people to have ties of spiritual friendship? Nowadays, even if spiritual people do not want to be bonded together, they will be forced to do so by the devil. Through his abundant evil, the devil actually brings about a great good for the people of today. For example, suppose that a believing father wants to have a tutor for his children. He will be obliged to find a good and believing teacher to provide this service in his household. A teacher who is a believer but has not yet been assigned to a school wants to tutor children and, and will want to find a good family to feel secure. A tradesman who lives spiritually, be he a painter or electrician or builder, will look to find work in a good family to feel at ease and to avoid the troubles he would otherwise encounter in a worldly setting. By the same token, a Christian family man 
will seek to bring into his house a good tradesman who is also a believer. Thus each will be looking to find another spiritual person with whom he can cooperate. Gradually, spiritual people will come to know one another through the various trades and professions. In the end, the devil, with his evil work, actually does some good, without wanting to, by separating the sheep from the goats. The sheep and the goats will be separated, and there shall become one flock, one shepherd. John 10.16 You see, in the past, the villages had a shepherd, and each of the villagers would give him their sheep or goats. One five, another ten, and he would pasture the sheep and the goats together. Because back then the goats were tame and did not butt the sheep with their horns. Now the goats have gone wild and are savagely butting Christ's sheep. The sheep in turn are seeking a good shepherd in a flock made up of sheep only. For the world has now become fit only for those who live in sin. For this reason people will separate themselves the sheep will be separated from the goats. Those who want to live a spiritual life will eventually find that they're not able to do it in this world. They will be searching to find people like themselves, people of God. They'll want to have a spiritual father to guide them, and they will distance themselves all the more from sin. And this good is now being achieved by the devil in his evil ways, without him wanting to. So, now we see in the cities and the villages too, some people running to nightclubs and entertainment centers, while others are going to church for vigils, for supplicatory prayers, for spiritual gatherings, and these people are united among themselves. In difficult times, a strong fellowship is formed among people. During the war, we lived as soldiers for two years in the platoon and were closer than brothers because we shared the difficulties and the dangers. We were so close-knit that we called each other brother. They were people of the world with worldly mentalities, and yet they did not want to be separated from each other. They had not read the gospel, nor any spiritual books. They only had a simple, worldly education in the good sense, but they also had the most important thing of all, love, a sense of brotherhood, a spirit of fellowship with one another. Recently, one of our comrades from the army died, and all the others gathered at his funeral from all over the country. A fellow army man also came to see me here. How tightly he embraced me. I could not break loose from his warm, brotherly embrace. Now we are fighting the devil. So try to become more brotherly and to have a brotherly fellowship. That's how we will all be able to walk together on the steep path of ascent toward sweet Golgotha. Spiritual kinship. Yerunda, yesterday you told us that you felt all the people you saw recently to be your brothers. How are we to understand spiritual kinship? We are brothers and sisters in the flesh with all people. We are all brothers and sisters and servants of God, and the faithful are also by grace children of God, redeemed by the divine blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In the spiritual life, we are related in the flesh to Adam and in the spirit to Christ. Those who live spiritually experience this spiritual kinship. They think the same way and have the same aims and goals. But if you had, for example, a sister in the flesh who followed her own routine and lived a worldly life, you would not feel a spiritual kinship with her. Is spiritual kinship ever dissolved? When someone ceases to live spiritually, he ceases to have a relationship with the other who continues to live spiritually. This separation is self-imposed. He is not distanced by the other. The more someone lives according to God, the more closely he can approach him, and the more he distances himself from a godly life, the more he is isolated from him. God does not send him away. It is he who distances himself from God's presence, and just as divine grace is a power that acts from afar and is transmitted to people, the devil's evil power is also activated from afar and transmitted. For example, two souls who are in a spiritual state and think of each other share a spiritual contact that transfers divine energy to one another. By the same token, two souls who are living in sin 
and happened to have some communication, exchange demonic influence even from afar, like a telegraph being sent back and forth to one another. Yet on the, when there is such a demonic communication between two people and one changes for the better, is the other person helped? Yes, he gets no response because the other doesn't pick up the receiver. The line is cut and there's no longer any communication between them. This may make him think and decide that he too ought to change his way of life. If we have regular contact with someone who has passions but are not swayed by them, can we influence that person's character? If we happen to have a spiritual condition, a little sanctity, we can be of much help. Because the divine grace of God influences our fellow human being, when we tolerate our brother through love, he senses it. And by the same token, when there is hatred in us, even when it is not expressed, again he senses it. A soul transmits that which it possesses. Passion transmits passion. Anger transmits anger. Rage transmits rage. Whereas when the soul is filled with virtues, virtue will transmit virtue. In other words, if someone keeps company with virtuous people, he'll be helped. Of course he'll be helped. If you enter a monastic cell where incense is burned on a regular basis, you will come out smelling of incense. If you enter a stable, you will pick up the smell of the stable. If you visit a worldly home, you will smell of secular perfumes when you leave. During the German occupation, we had a little over an acre of various melons that we cultivated. We had the American type from the agricultural school that were white and this big and very sweet. We also had the native melons from Argos and so on. If pumpkins happened to be planted close to the sweet American melons, the sweetness left the melon and went into the pumpkin. The pumpkin was sweetened and the melon became tasteless. This is what happens with the cross-pollination which the bees carry out by going from one flower to another. If you see a melon with a large navel mark, you should know that that melon was grown close to a pumpkin. If a native melon from Argos is close to a good sweet melon, it will receive sweetness from the good sweet melon. The sweet melon will lose its sweetness, but at least that sweetness will go to another melon. If a pumpkin is close to a good melon, the sweetness will go to the pumpkin, and if you go and cook it, then it will need a lot of salt. The melon loses, but at the same time the pumpkin doesn't gain. Whereas if it is a melon, the good melon may lose, but at least the other melon will gain. It will become sweeter. What I want to say is that if a Christian who is not very advanced goes near one who is spiritually advanced, the more advanced person may grow weary and lose something, but the less advanced person will benefit. But if a non-believer goes near a spiritual person, the spiritual person's time and effort will be wasted. At most, the secular person might be slightly moved by some of the things the spiritual person may say to him and consider them from a secular philosophical point of view. That is, he will understand them in a secular way and will not be able to benefit from them spiritually. In other words, what we'll have is a slightly sweeter pumpkin. Be careful what company you keep. In our communications center in the Army, we had an organizational chart to identify the distinctive signals of all our stations to be able to tell which were our own and which were the enemies. For a while, we were under training at the communications center, serving as intermediaries and identifying the signals. We would say to the other, what is this, or one, just to see what they would say, and this way we would work out who they were. That is, when we were not certain which station it was, we had no confidence. And with tic-tac tricks, we would try to make the identification. The same thing happens in spiritual life. When we see that a particular station is a foreign one, we must say, well, am I going to cooperate with him? Of course not. It is a serious matter to recognize a foreign station and decide to cooperate with it, and far worse to recognize it not only a foreign but also an enemy station, and thus to collaborate with the enemy. I wish to emphasize that in our relations with others we must exercise discernment and care. The safest way 
is to consult one's spiritual father. Even in conversations, we must be careful, because sometimes they begin as spiritual conversations and end up as gossip. And it is not only that we are wasting our time, we are also wasting our souls when condemning someone else, for we have no right to judge other people or other situations. If we can, following a painful conversation, we should try to help in an unpleasant situation. We should not even speak ill of the dead, because every soul is fortunately in God's hands. I have noticed how frequently many people's thoughts are damaged by a careless word. If we were to be taxed for every word we uttered, do you know how careful we would be? If the rule were, if you say so many words, you will pay so much tax, we would end up counting our words. Even on the telephone, we try to think out what we will say, how long we will be able to talk, because we have to pay. Much time is now lost in idle talk. It is written in the Ladder of Divine Ascent that distraction is the offspring of hatred. Can love ever exist in simple gossip? Footnote C. St. John Climacus, The Ladder of Divine Ascent, Step 10, verses 1 to 2. To continue, yes, if we love a person envied by others, we can say something against that person to discourage the envy. We must see all the perspectives, but a damaged or disturbed soul who thinks that he is being wronged and feels embittered and indignant may, given an excuse, lash out with such indignation and do so much harm to other souls that even the devil himself could not do. Judas was indignant over the waste of the precious myrrh, which the myrrh-bearing woman poured out on Jesus and commented that it could have been sold and the money given to the poor. The other apostles who had grace were influenced by Judas. They had considered what he said to be externally correct and were influenced, for they did not know his greedy heart. And you see, Christ had given, even given to Judas the responsibility of holding the money bag in order to satiate his passion as he used to take what was put into it. John 12, 6. Yet under, what should someone do when two people disagree and they ask for his opinion? If you find yourself with people who have personal differences, it is better to express your opinion in front of both of them Otherwise, each may take a word of yours out of context as it suits him and then use it as heavy artillery, should his words carry weight, striking mercilessly at his opponent and thus risk being struck himself for no good reason by the flying missiles. One should avoid such persons as much as possible in order to be tranquil and able to pray for their peace and for the peace of the world in general. When it is impossible to entirely avoid such scandalous people, we should at least try to avoid much interaction with them and limit the scandals. It doesn't matter that some people have no evil in them but only a simple superficiality because they too, through their superficiality, can cause scandals. Maternal love. Yet under are those who love discreetly, spiritually pure. There are many cases. It may often be a matter of simply worldly politeness. Some people are kind and polite, but this doesn't mean they're also spiritually noble with a sense of sacrifice. To have certain good traits is another matter. One who has worldly politeness and is hypocritical can do a lot of harm because the other person is fooled into opening his heart and wasting his devoutness on a secular person who has no idea what devoutness is. This is like giving gold coins to someone who is only familiar with bronze drachmas. Moreover, one must not waste time trying to spiritually admonish people who are only at ease with worldly conversations and who only wish to selfishly express their own opinions. Yet under what should we do when someone comes and tells us his problem over and over again when in fact it has been more or less taken care of? When the problem is stated for the first time, it is right to allow someone to speak for as long as he wants and say as much as he needs to say. Then you have to listen to him. If you don't, he will think you are tired of him and don't understand him. Later, however, if he continues to repeat the same things, you'll tell him, it is not that I can't listen to you, 
but to do so won't do you any good. You turn even the summer into winter. Now you are better. It is spring. Soon it will be summer. But you think of winter and the summer, and you catch a cold. Sometimes, however, one can observe the following, even among spiritual people. Someone goes to tell his sorrow to someone else who does not want to listen and be deprived of his joyfulness. He may pretend to be in a hurry to go somewhere, or he may change the subject in order not to be upset. This is utterly satanic. It is as if someone is dying next to me, and I move further away so that I can keep on singing. Where then is the scriptural verse, weep with those who weep, Romans 12.15, especially when it concerns serious ecclesiastical issues, and as a Christian one does not share the anguish of another, then that person does not participate in the body of the church. When I don't excuse others for some action of theirs, does this mean that I have a hard heart? You don't excuse others, but you excuse yourself? Then tomorrow Christ will not excuse you. Your heart can become hard as a rock in an instant if you are not careful, and it can equally quickly become tender. You must acquire a maternal heart. You see, a mother will forgive all things and sometimes will pretend not to see certain mischief. Be patient with others and excuse them. Tolerate others so that Christ will tolerate you. Yet unto how does the heart expand and grow? When you always excuse the mischief, the imperfections and the shortcomings of others, and you see yourself mirrored in them, of course, the evil one may sometimes bring second thoughts about others, especially if there's some reason. But it is up to us to accept these thoughts or repel them. When we put ourselves in someone else's shoes, we will sympathize and want to excuse them. Also, if something is not done out of malice, but out of superficiality, the action informs us and does not provoke a reaction. It is only natural for human weaknesses to exist among all human beings but it is wrong to have an evil disposition. If someone is feeling badly and I am well, can I influence him? What if it is a temptation making it seem that way? How do you know that you are in a better state than the other person? From the moment I believe that I am better than the next person and I feel sorry for him, I should feel sorry for myself and not the other. Even when we see that the other person is really not spiritually well, we should still make excuses for him. Only for himself should someone not make excuses. He should judge himself worse than others and grieve for his own shortcomings. Such a person will recognize that he has not done anything for all that God has given him and will confess, My God, do not take me into account. Put me off to the side. I have nothing, done nothing to merit your help. But do help the other person. Those who actually do progress spiritually do not recognize their great progress. They only experience great compunction and humility and the love of God together with an inexpressible exaltation of joy. Chapter 4. Devoutness Moves God What is devoutness? Yet another, what is devoutness? Devoutness is the fear of God, modesty, spiritual sensitivity, a devout person may strain to make great efforts, but this straining drips honey into his heart. It does not turn his life into a martyrdom. It is an enjoyable experience. The actions of a devout person are refined and careful. He strongly feels the presence of God, the angels, the saints. He senses his guardian angel nearby watching over him. He always keeps in mind that his body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and lives a simple, pure, and sanctified life. His behavior is always well thought out, marked by modesty and awareness of all that is sacred. For instance, he is careful not to turn his back on the holy icons. He does not place the sacred scripture or any spiritual book where he sits, and so on. If he looks upon an icon, his heart flutters, and his eyes flow with tears. Even when he merely sees the name of Christ written down somewhere, he will bow reverently and kiss it, his soul overflowing with sweetness, even for a small piece of newspaper thrown to the ground and bearing the name of Christ, or simply Church of the Holy Trinity, 
A devout person will bend down, pick it up, and kiss it with reverence, feeling sadness to see it thrown away like that. Yeronde is piety one thing and devoutness another. Footnote, with the term piety here in English, the elder refers to the observation of external forms of devotion, which have no inner correspondence. Piety is a perfume, while devoutness is incense. For me, the greatest virtue is devoutness, because the devout person attracts the grace of God, becomes a receiver of grace, and the grace of God remains naturally with him. Consequently, divine grace reveals the devout, and everyone respects and loves him, whereas the impudent are avoided by young and old. You women should be more devout than men. It especially behooves a woman to be devout because of her nature. When men are not devout, they are simply indifferent. But women, when they lose their devoutness, do extreme things. Someone told me, when I went on a pilgrimage with my wife to the Holy Land, I also went to the River Jordan to be baptized, and my wife sat on the banks of the river washing her feet. What are you doing, I told her. You came to the River Jordan to wash your feet? I was so upset. I swore at her. It seems that she was completely indifferent to the sacredness of the place, while the poor fellow had so much devoutness. Devoutness is transmitted. Yet under how can I acquire devoutness? The fathers say that to acquire devoutness, one must associate with devout people and observe how they behave. When St. Paisios the Great was asked, How can I acquire the fear of God? He answered, You must associate with people who love God and have the fear of God in their heart, so that you too may acquire such divine fear. Footnote the sayings of the Desert Fathers, Abba Piman. To continue, this of course does not mean that you should do outwardly whatever you see others doing without feeling it within you, for this would not be true devoutness, it would be false. Anything false is abhorrent. Devoutness is the grace of God in man. Whatever the devout person does, he does because he feels it in his heart. Of course, there is natural devoutness within us, but if we don't cultivate it, the devil will use our forgetfulness to make us insensitive and not devout. But the behavior of the devout awakens devoutness in us again. Yeronda, why do the fathers speak only of devoutness when they advise us to acquire it by associating with those who are devout? Why do they not say the same about other virtues as also? Because devoutness is a transmittable virtue. The movements and behavior of a devout person are transmitted like perfume, provided the recipient possesses goodwill and humility. And let me tell you, if one is not devout, one has nothing. A devout person can clearly recognize all things sacred as they truly are, even though he may not be educated. For example, he will not err in anything that has to do with the divine meanings. It is much like small children who do not have any negative thoughts about their father or mother because they love and respect them and are able to see clearly and properly what their parents are doing. How much more so in this case, where we have to do with God, who is incomparable and perfect in all things. One who is not devout falls into errors and falsehoods regarding the doctrine of the faith. I can see what errors are made when those who are not devout write interpretations and commentaries on the sacred texts of the Holy Scripture. All spiritual things require devoutness and heart. When everything begins with devoutness, everything is sanctified. Specifically, in order to write a service for a saint, one must love the saint and have reverence and devoutness for that saint, so that everything one writes will be heartfelt and exude authentic devoutness. When one reaches a state of divine eros, divine madness, the verses flow naturally from within. What else can help us acquire devoutness? Study with the mind everything that is sacred and truly digest these readings. But also make use of any opportunities afforded. This will gradually awaken devoutness in us. For instance, if I have the chance to pass by a church to pray and I don't take it, I am deprived of grace. 
But if I want to go and something prevents me, then I am not deprived of grace, because God sees my good intention. Much help in acquiring devoutness is also found in becoming familiar with the saints of our region, our country, so that we can love them and feel a link with them. God rejoices when we love the saints and show devotion to them. And if we show devotion to the saints, our devotion to God will, of course, be greater. Yet under what can help us to move about in church with devout reverence? When you set out to go to the church, you should say to yourself, Where am I going? I am now entering the house of God. What do I do? I revere the holy icons and I worship God himself. From your monastic cell or from your assigned obedience, you go to the church. From the church, you go to heaven, and beyond heaven, to God himself. How is this done? The church is the house of God, and our own true home is in paradise. Here the nuns are chanting, there the angels, the saints. If we politely knock at the door, wipe our feet, and sit reservedly upon entering a worldly home, How are we then to behave when we enter the house of God where Christ is being sacrificed? With one drop of divine blood, he once redeemed us from sin and now continues to heal us with kilos of his blood and to nurture us with his all-holy body. Therefore, when we recall all these awe-inspiring divine events, it helps us to move about in the church devoutly. But I see in the divine liturgy, even when the priest says, Let us lift up our hearts, and we respond, We have lifted them up to the Lord. Few are those who truly raise their mind to the Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps it is better for us to pray with our mind, May our hearts be raised to the Lord. Because both our mind and our heart have a tendency to be drawn downward. Otherwise, we are lying when we say, We have raised them up to the Lord. When in fact, our mind is not there at all. Of course, if our heart is indeed turned toward heaven, then everything will surely go toward heaven. How does it help to chant with contrition? Keep your mind focused on the divine meanings of the hymns and approach them devoutly. Don't grasp the divine meanings as literature, but with your heart. Devoutness is one thing and art, the art of chanting, another. Art without devoutness is paint. When the chanter chants devoutly, the chanting overflows from his heart and he chants with contrition. When one is in a wholesome spiritual state, everything will be all right. This is why one must be well-ordered inside and be able to chant with his heart, with devoutness, in order to actually chant with contrition. If someone has negative, inappropriate thoughts, what kind of chanting can he possibly offer? He cannot possibly chant with the heart. Why does the sacred scripture say, Is any among you cheerful? Let him chant praise. James 5.13 When St. John Cucuzelis once chanted, while pasturing the goats, the goats got up and stood upright. This is how people realized that he was indeed Cucuzelis, the chanter of the imperial court. Whatever you do, do it with your heart and do it for Christ. Put devoutness even into your embroidery, for it will be used with the sacred vessels, and even those you make for the katzion. Footnote, a large censer used to sense the church at certain points in the liturgical services by the appointed person who wears an embroidered covering draped over his right shoulder, his or her right shoulder. Above the handle of the censer is the cup where the charcoal and the incense are placed, and around the edge of the censer little bells or hanging to make a rhythmic sound during the sensing. To continue, when someone is devout, his spiritual beauty is apparent in everything he does. It shows in his reading and in his chanting, even in his mistakes. In his mistakes? Yes, you can see that even the mistakes a devout person happens to make will profess devoutness, a certain kind of modesty. Outward Piety One who has great faith and true devoutness is nurtured by something higher, spiritual, which cannot be readily described. But there are those who have an arid, outward piety, who say dryly, Now that I'm entering the church, I must sit carefully, I mustn't move, I must bow my head, and this is how I must cross myself. 
Others may question their faith, yet stand throughout an all-night vigil. Yet under, do they do this because they are restless and searching for something? There must be something going on inside. This is all very well, but one must feel something inside. It must not be merely an outward show. It is one thing to take off your hat as you enter the church out of devoteness, and quite another to remove it to cool your head. Devoteness can be seen by the way we receive the gift of Holy Communion, by the way we receive the Andiron, and so on. Yet can one be annoyed by someone else's expression of devoutness? Look, if someone makes the sign of a large cross but does it simply, humbly, it doesn't annoy. But if it's done to show off over and over again, then people will begin to make fun of him. Or if when passing by a church, he looks to see if there are other people watching him or patiently waits for them to gather and then begins to make the sign of the cross and prostrations to be seen, then indeed people are right to make fun of him. You see, a worldly spirit is frowned upon. True devoutness shows. Without true devoutness, what is normally becoming and decent becomes unbecoming and indecent. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. When people bring you a sick person's clothing to place on the holy relics to be sanctified, be careful to take only an undershirt and not other underclothing. It is inappropriate and impious. The sun, of course, cannot be polluted, nor is God polluted, but we can become possessed by the evil one through our lack of devoutness. In the past, when people got sick, they would take a little oil from the vigil oil lamp, rub it on their bodies, and they would get well. Now the vigil lamp is kept only as a formality, just to provide some light, and the oil, when they clean the vessel, is poured into the sink. Once I went to a home, and I saw the lady of the house washing the vigil lamp, and I asked her, where does the water from the sink go? Into the sewage system, she answered, and I had to ask her, how is it that you take oil from the vigil lamp to bless your child when it is sick, and now you pour the remnants of oil into the sewage system in order to clean the lamp? How can you justify this? How can you expect God's blessing to come to your home? In today's home, there's no place to put a sacred object, even the little piece of paper in which you may have wrapped the andiron. I remember in our home, even the water used to wash the dishes did not go into the sewage system. It was disposed of elsewhere because even the leftover crumbs were considered sacred since we prayed before and after the meal to bless everything. All of these customs have disappeared today and for this reason divine grace is also missing and people are susceptible to demonic influence. As much as we can, we must be careful in all things. After Holy Communion or the Andiron or holy unction, it is good to wipe our hands with some cotton wet with alcohol and to burn the cotton. When we sweep the sanctuary, what is gathered should be burned in a clean place or thrown into the sea, because some pieces of andiron or even of holy communion may have fallen there. Naturally, if the body and blood of holy communion is dropped on the floor, Christ does not remain there to be stepped upon, but grace leaves us. Abroad, the churches don't have separate cisterns for the waters of the proscomity, which go into the drains with the rainwater. We are forbidden to have separate cisterns for such purposes because they have become a breeding ground for bacteria, they say. While virtually everyone is now filled with bacteria of body and soul, people will still say that bacteria will be formed if a drop of sacred oil is put upon our heads. How then can the blessing of God come upon us? This is where the world's demonism starts from. Fortunately, there are a few devout women, young and old, and the world is saved. Yerunda, a lady asked us to paint an icon of St. Arsenios to place in her living room. Will she have only icons there? Won't she have other paintings, pictures, and so on? Won't they also smoke there? It would be better to put it in another room with the other icons and go there to pray. I went to a home once where the icons had been placed below the stairs, even though they had plenty of better places to put them. In another home, the icons had been placed in front of the waste pipe. 
and I asked the lady of the house, How did you ever think of putting the icons in this spot? This is where I am at ease with them, she answered. And it was not even the east side of the house, but the north. How then can the grace of God come to us? Sacred scripture says, For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that which he hath. Matthew thirteen twelve. We imagine that we have something, and whatever little we might have is taken away from us. Little by little, devoutness is lost altogether, and this is why the evil things we see are occurring. If one is not careful, one can even become possessed by the devil. There was a woman, God grant her forgiveness, for she is now gone, who had been possessed, because she poured the holy water down the drain. She had a small amount of holy water in a bottle. She thought, it must be stale by now, I'll pour it out and use the bottle for some other need. She poured out the holy water and washed out the bottle, because a tiny piece of sweet basil had remained in the bottle. After that, she became possessed. Grace had abandoned her, for grace cannot remain with a person who is devoid of any devoutness. Yet under what if someone pours out some holy water by mistake? If the same person had put the holy water in a cabinet and had forgotten about it and poured it out by mistake, then he, then he bears partial responsibility for the sin. But if another person had placed the holy water in the cabinet and the one who poured it out did not know that it was holy water, then he bears no responsibility. If a person has no reverence and does not respect all sacred matters, how can divine grace approach him? Grace will go to those who honor it. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, says the sacred scripture. If there is no spiritual sensitivity, there cannot be any progress. On the holy mountain, someone took pews out of a chapel and put them in his. Another person took the tiles from the roof of another chapel and used them for his veranda. When it rained, the water came into the sanctuary and fell on the holy altar. I went in once, and what did I see? The chapel had been consecrated, and at the center of the holy altar there was a holy relic, a vertebra. I picked it up and washed it at the holy water cistern. Later I went and talked to them, What are you doing? The chapel is consecrated, and you've removed the roof tiles, letting the water fall upon the holy altar. They later went with a roofer and somewhat repaired it. In another place, boards were removed from the sanctuary to make a boat dock. A storm came and washed away the boards and the cement. And people do not understand that all these things are so irreverent. I remember in Konitsa there was a grandfather who would chase away the children who scratched the walls of the church. He considered this to be irreverent. And now look at what is happening around us. Devoutness in all things. Here, too, we must be careful. A cloth adorned with crosses was spread out on a sofa. It is inappropriate to sit or step on crosses. Some Jewish merchants mark the bottom of shoes with crosses. Many times crosses are found not only on the outside of shoes, but also on the inside of the heel and the sole. How strange it is to pay money for the shoes and to be stepping on crosses. Long ago, these people had made some baby rattles with Panagia and Christ on one side and Karagiosis. Uh, footnote, it's a main character of Greek shadow theater, a popular form of entertainment derived from folk tradition. Destitute, barefoot, ugly, and hunchbacked, he mocked the poor folk's traits such as cleverness, cunningness, servility, and laziness. Karagiosis. To continue, people will say, Karagiotsi is on one side, Christ on the other, what does it matter? And the poor people would see Christ and the Panagia and buy them for their little children. The children dropped the rattle, it was stepped upon and soiled. And now people told me that Roman Catholic missionaries somewhere near China are wearing some necklaces which have Christ on the inside and Buddha on the outside. I either place Christ alone on the inside or confess Christ openly, otherwise the grace of God does not come. 
Here in Greece, some people in authority without thinking have placed Panagia on a stamp, which is usually thrown away and stepped upon. Yeronda, can someone be devout in some things and not in others? No, if he is truly devout, he will be devout in all things. Once a priest was staying at the monastery of Stavronokita, and once during the reading of the six psalms, he lowered the pusit, the stasidi, and sat. Father, they're reading the six psalms, I told him. This way I can enjoy it all the more, he told me. Just think, years later he came and found me. He told me that he was preparing icons and giving them away as a blessing. I asked him, how do you glue the icons? He explained, I put glue on the wood, position the paper icon on the wood, and when I have a stack of them, I pile them up and sit on them so they can stick well. Then I take a book and read for a while. When I heard this, my hair stood on end. I said, what are you doing? You're sitting on the icon so they can stick? Why not, he said, isn't it proper? Do you see where this is going? The bad thing is that this lack of devoutness gets worse. It never stops. Man evolves, either for the better or for the worse. See where that priest started from and where he ended up. This way I can enjoy the six psalms all the more, he said then, and afterward he reached the point of saying, by sitting on them, the icons will stick, and I can do some reading. Then he thought it strange what I told him about the six psalms. And there were other older fathers who were standing at the time. They leaned a little on the stasidi and did not move at all. It is one thing if someone is very tired or sick and his legs are weak and he is sitting for that reason. Christ of will, of course, not condemn him. But it is very different to imagine this to be the right way and even to add the remark, I enjoy the Psalms more when I am sitting. How can you justify this? Spiritual life is not a matter of enjoyment. If you're hurting, sit. Christ is not a tyrant. Abba Isaac says, if you cannot stand, sit. St. Isaac the Syrian's Setical Homily number 20. And number 51 and number 75. To continue, he does not say, if you can, sit. Yeranda why don't we sit during the reading of the six psalms? Because they symbolize the judgment. During the reading of the six psalms, our mind should be thinking of the hour of judgment. The reading takes about six or seven minutes. During the first part, we do not even make the sign of the cross because now Christ will come not to be crucified, but will come as judge. People were so devout in the past. Yet on the why is devoutness so hard to find nowadays? Because people have stopped living spiritually. They interpret everything using worldly reasoning and banish divine grace. And the people in the past, they were so devout. In the Serta prefecture in central Greece, there were some grandmothers who had such simplicity and devoutness that they would bow to the mules of the holy monastery of, of Prusos whenever they came down from Prusos to provide for the needs of the monastery. These are the mules of Panagia, they would say, and bow down with reverence. Now, if they showed such devoutness to the mules of the monastery of Panagia, imagine what devoutness they showed to Panagia herself. Yet under was the devoutness of the Pharisee Siotis instilled in them by St. Arsenios? the devoutness of those from Farasa, his village. They had devoutness, and the saint cultivated it further. This is the tradition. Prodromus Kotsinlugu, the elder chanter of St. Arsenios, was very devout. He was over 80 years old, and he still walked half an hour to go to the lower parts of Konitsa to chant in the church. I am a dog of Christ, he would say. During the cold winter, the frozen word were, roads were very dangerous. The waters from the springs would flow downhill and freeze, and you had to find a spot to walk and not slip. He defied all obstacles to attend church and chant. Now that's devoteness. My parents told me that those from Farasa and their ancestral town in Asia Minor had collected money to build a church. 
However, later St. Arsenios wanted to distribute the money to poor families since they already had a church. The saint went to distribute the money to the poor families in the region and they would not take it. They would not take money away from the church. Then the saint decided to send the money to the bishop in Caesarea by the town president. Footnote, the president of the town of Farasa was the father of Elder Paisios. To continue, the saint told him, take some companion with you for the road. Your blessing is sufficient, the president replied and went on his way alone. When he arrived, the bishop asked him, but what did uh, Haji Infiniti St. Arseni want you to do with the money? To distribute it to the poor families in the area, the president replied. And why didn't you do as he asked? The people would not accept the money because it belongs to the church, he said. Finally, the bishop insisted that the money go back to Farasa. When the Farasiotis were leaving their town with the exchange of populations, they asked St. Arsenios to take the money with them in order to build a church here in Greece. Then St. Arsenios told them with tears in his eyes, In Greece you will find many churches, but not the faith which exists here. Reverence for Icons What reverence we must have for the holy icons. A monk once prepared an icon of St. Nicholas to give to someone as a blessing. He wrapped it in a clean piece of paper and placed it in a cabinet until the time came to give it. But without realizing it, he placed it upside down. After a while, a rattling sound could be heard in the room. The monk looked around to see where the sound was coming from. He did not realize at first that it was coming from the cabinet. The rattle continued for some time, tap, 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 and would not leave him in peace. Finally, when he approached the cabinet and realized the sound was coming from there, he opened it and heard the sound coming from the icon. Let me see what is the matter with this icon, he said to himself and unwrapped it. He saw what had happened, stood the icon upright, and immediately the sound stopped. The devout person will especially venerate the holy icons, and when we say he will venerate the holy icons, we mean he venerates the person depicted on the icon. When someone has a picture of his father, his mother, his grandfather or grandmother, his brother, he cannot possibly tear it or step on it. How much more must we venerate the icons of saints? Jehovah's Witnesses have no icons. The honor we show to the icons they, they consider to be idolatry. I asked one of them once, don't you have photographs in your homes? Yes, we do. Well, then, does a mother kiss the photograph of her child when that child is far away? Yes, she does, he said. Does she kiss the paper of the photograph or her child? I asked, and he replied, she kisses her child. Well, then, just as she kisses her child when she kisses his photograph, we kiss Christ when we kiss his icon. We don't kiss the paper or the wood. Yeronda, even if a plank of wood had been once painted with an icon of Christ or Panagia or of a saint, and the colors have faded over time, are we not still to show reverence for it? Yes, of course. When someone venerates the holy icons with devoutness and fervent love, he absorbs the colors from them, and the saints are imprinted on his soul. The saints are pleased when they are lifted up from the paper or the wood and imprinted in people's hearts. When a Christian devoutly kisses the holy icons and prays for help from Christ, from Panagia, the saints, he draws into his heart not only the grace of Christ, of Panagia, and of the saints, but also the whole of Christ, or of Panagia, or of a saint, and places them upon the iconostasis of his own temple. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 3, 16. You see, every divine service begins and ends with the veneration of the holy icons. If people could understand this, they would feel such joy. They would receive so much power. Yet in the supplicatory service of the Panagia, why does a verse in the hymn of praise say, Speechless be the lips of the impious who do not venerate your sacred icon? When someone is not devout and kisses, yet kisses the icons, 
Are his lips not speechless? And when the devout kisses the icons, aren't his lips full of praise? There are some people who do not even touch the icon when they venerate it. Others touch only their lips to the icon when they kiss it. Here, like this, the elder reverenced an icon kissing it without a sound. Did you hear anything? No. Well, then, speechless are the lips, whereas the devout person kisses the icon and you can hear the sound of the kiss. In that case, the lips are eloquent with praise. It is not a matter of cursing when the verse says speechless, but rather that those lips are without a sound, while the others are eloquent with sounds. When we look upon the holy icons, our hearts should be overflowing with love for God and for the saints, and we should prostrate ourselves to venerate them and kiss them devoutly. If you could only see a devout elderly monk, Father Savas, in the monastery of Philotheu, with what devoutness, with what heart, he would venerate the holy icon of Panagia, the sweet-kissing Glycophilusa. And this icon of Panagia, which the fathers always kissed at the, time, at the same spot, a little bump had formed over the years. The icon which is painted with devoutness draws the grace of God from the devout iconographer and then transmits eternal consolation to the faithful. The iconographer is depicted, translated into the icon he makes. And for this reason, the iconographer's spiritual state is very important. Father Tikhon, uh, footnote, see uh, the book Elder Paisios of the Holy Mountain wrote, Athenite Fathers and Athenite Matters. To continue, Father Tikhon used to tell me, My son, when I paint the Epitaphios icon, I chant the hymn, The noble Joseph, after taking down your sacred body from the cross, wrapped it in a clean shroud and laid it in a new tomb. He used to chant as he shed tears, and his tears fell upon the icon. Such an icon preaches an eternal message to the faithful of the world. The holy icons preach eternally down through the centuries. One who is suffering will look upon an icon of Christ or of Panagia and directly receive consolation. The foundation is devoutness. You see, someone may lean against the wall where an icon has stood, and he receives grace while another may own the best icon, but because he's not devout, receives no benefit. Or one may benefit from a simple wooden cross, while another who is not devout may not even benefit from the true precious cross itself. We offer the purest to God. Once I was scandalized here in your church. I saw a candle burning on the holy altar that was this short, even on my candle stand before the Akanastasis, I do not leave such a small candle to burn. I feel it would show contempt. Yet on the people say that the candle should be allowed to burn to the end. Yes, it should burn to the end, but where? This is important. It is one thing for the candle to burn to the end on the candle stands where the congregation light their candles, and another thing for it to burn to the end on the holy altar or the holy prothesis. It is inappropriate to leave half a candle burning on the holy altar. Also, on the great chandelier, the candles should be changed if they become very small, even though they may last through the entire service. During the Divine Liturgy, use a large candle for the small and the great entrance, for it symbolizes St. John the Forerunner. In some places, they put the vigil oil lamps out to economize. Don't they understand that God will send them great blessings? when they show devoutness for him? Also, it is inappropriate to use for memorial services the very thin candles that look like candle fillers. It is a disgrace to give these tiny things to others. Yet the, may the nuns burn in their cells as many candles as they want. Let them burn the candles, and may the devil burn too. And after all, the whole world is burning. Only be sure the candle you are burning has meaning and always accompany it with prayer. It is a great thing to put your trust in God. We eat the sweet fruit and offer God the resin of trees with the censer. We eat the honey and offer God the beeswax. And even to that we add paraffin. One candle we offer to God as a token of gratitude for his abundant blessings. And even that is not pure because we mix it with paraffin. Imagine if God expected us to offer to him the honey. I can only imagine what we would do then. 
Either a watery broth or a little sugary water is all that we would offer. May God not take us too seriously. We can be thrifty in all things except in the worship of God. To God we must offer the purest and the best we have. Yet and the people do not easily understand that burning paraffin candles is a sign that our devoutness is, is flawed. Tell the people, it is not good for your health to burn paraffin candles in church. They may think a little about this. And if the church is small, people will have trouble breathing. It is better to light one small beeswax candle than a huge taper made of paraffin. This is why many get dizzy and faint in churches. It is unhealthy to burn all that paraffin in such a small church. And this is not all. People want to use in the vigil lamps oils that are not fit for consumption. What are we coming to? It says in the Old Testament that the oil used in the temple had to be made from olives gathered from the trees and not from those that had fallen to the ground. Not that God has any need of that oil or of the incense. No, but God is moved because it is an offering which expresses man's gratitude and love for him. At Mount Sinai, I was impressed by the Bedouins, who had nothing to offer, but still they gather some very small stones that are different from the others, or if they find a few leaves in the cracks of the mountain, they gather them and go up and leave them on the rock, which Moses struck with his rod and water gushed out. Or the mothers who are nursing their babies go there to drip a few drops of their milk with the thought, may God grant me milk to nurse my children. You can see the gratitude they have. It is not a small matter. And look at us. Those Bedouins will judge us. They leave on the rock little pieces of wood, a few leaves, some bright little stones. Has God any need of these? No, but God helps because he sees the good heart, the virtuous disposition. This is how their good intentions are expressed. Yeronda, when we light a candle, do we say that it is for a particular purpose? You light the candle. Where are you sending it? Aren't you sending it somewhere? With the candle, we're asking God for something. When you light the candle and say, this is for those who are suffering bodily and spiritually and for those who have the greatest need, both the living and the dead are included. Do you know how much consolation the dead receive when you light a candle for them? This way we can have spiritual communication with both the living and the dead. In other words, the candle serves as an antenna, bringing us into communication with God, with the sick, and with those who have fallen asleep in the Lord, and so on. Yet on the why do we burn incense? We burn it to praise God. We glorify Him, and we are grateful to Him for His abundant benefactions to us and to the entire world. Incense, like the candle, is also an offering. And having offered it to God and to the saints by sensing the holy icons, we then also sense the living icons of God, the faithful men and women who have gathered in the church. You must put your heart into it, whether it is an expression of gratitude or a request. With each candle I say, May God, my God, with all my heart I ask you to do me a favor. And with the incense I say, I thank you, God, with all my heart for all your gifts. I thank you for forgiving my many sins and the ingratitude of all the people and my own abundant ingratitude. Cultivate your devoutness and your modesty as much as you can. This will help you receive the grace of God. For if, if someone is devout and spiritually modest and humble too, he can expect to receive divine grace. If he has no devoutness and no humility, the grace of God does not come to him. What does the sacred scripture say? But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. Isaiah 66, verse 2. Chapter 5. Self-offering provides divine oxygen. People tend to forget those who suffer. Yet and you have said that the more we deprive ourselves of human consolation, the more we receive divine consolation. Is this why prayer is felt more when one is hungry? Yes, but a hungry person can also understand the hungry. A satiated person cannot understand the suffering of the hungry. 
I heard that somewhere people throw away food, and down the street there are people, some Greek origin Russian refugees from Pontus, who have no food to eat. These poor people live in hot houses and corrugated iron shacks. Let's say that those who throw away the food do not know of the needy people nearby. Can't they at least ask and find out? They threw they throw the food away. We refuse to give away even things that we no longer need. It is a sin when people hold on to things they no longer need and refuse to give them away to those who really need them and are unable to buy them. That, for me, is the greatest hell. At the hour of judgment, Christ will tell us, For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. Some people who have everything say, There are no poor people today. They don't think of others. They don't put themselves in other people's shoes so as not to be disturbed and lose their peace of mind. Then how can they possibly find the poor and the hungry? But if you think of others, you will seek out the poor and find out what they need. There are so many orphans who have no one to show them some human warmth. People tend to forget those who suffer. Their mind is on the wealthy who have everything, and they compare themselves with them instead of those who are suffering. If only they could think, for example, of some northern Epirus, folks there who've been imprisoned for 20 years in a tiny cell simply for making the sign of the cross, then perhaps they would see things differently. It is a terrible thing. We cannot even imagine it. Do you know what it means to be in a one-by-one-meter cell? The prisoner cannot sit up lie down, or even stand up. As for a window, there may be a hole in the wall. This was spoken in May of 1990. Yet that is more like a grave than a prison. At least in the grave one is spread out flat, and the tortures that go on in those prisons. There is so much suffering today. The world is making weapons and has abandoned those who suffer. In Africa, I saw people eat camel droppings. The people there have bodies that don't look like bodies. They look like frogs. Their chest is like a little basket of bamboo strips. Why am I troubled? We have everything and can't feel the pain of others, and yet we still want to go to paradise. When I went to the holy monastery of Stomion, in 1958, there was in Konitsa a Protestant who was supported financially from America and who had proselytized 80 families. He had also constructed a building where the families gathered. Those poor people had great needs, and because of their great poverty, they were forced to become Protestants, for they were then helped financially. One day one of them said to me, Because of my great need, I would even become a Jew. When I heard this, I said to myself, something must be done. I gathered a few people who were somewhat better off and could help, and I talked to them. At the time, these people were entirely worldly, but at least were well disposed. One soul in particular, although entirely worldly then, was great-hearted. When I saw her, I said to myself, on the outside she looks like a rotten branch, but inside she is good kindling. We decided to collect some money and give it to the poor families. Whatever money was gathered, I told them to go and give it to themselves to the poor so that they themselves might be helped spiritually. This way, even if their heart was hard as stone, it would soften and become a human heart, and the gate of paradise would open up for them too. Soon all of them changed heart because they could see the suffering that existed around them and did not have the heart to go out and have fun. They would tell me, You have disarmed us. How can we go now to entertain ourselves? They also came close to the church. Later I learned that one of them became a chanter. But the 80 families, two by the grace of God, returned to the Orthodox Church, one after the other. Later, when the American Protestants came to see the work of the Protestant who had proselytized the families, they took him to court because he no longer had any followers. Yet under some people will readily ask for help when they are in need, while others say nothing. Many are ashamed and do not want to be exposed. 
These people are in greater need, and any help given to them matters more. I know of two doctors who for some reason became so poor that they did not have money to even buy some aspirin. For someone who has love in him, it's not enough to simply give to anyone who happens to ask for charity. He seeks to find people who have some need in order to support them. My mother always looked to find such cases. The Criterion of Love When someone has the wherewithal to give charity, you can't be sure whether he has love or not, for he may not be giving out of love, but just to get rid of certain things. When someone does not have much and yet does, does offer charity, then his love is evident. Let us suppose that I believe I have love. God, in order to test my love, sends me a poor person. For example, if I have two watches, a good one and a slightly damaged one, and I give the inferior watch to the poor man, this indicates that my love is of secondary quality. If I have real love, I will give the poor man my good watch. However, faulty thinking overtakes us, and we say, why should I give my good watch to someone who has none? For him, even the old broken watch will be good enough. But when you give the old watch, then the old self still lives in you. But if you give the new watch, then you are renewed, a reborn man, according to the gospel. It is a damnable state, when you keep both watches and give neither away. Yet on the how can someone get out of that state? He should think, if it were Christ himself, what would I give? Certainly the better watch. This is how we can see which love is the real one. He will then make a decisive choice and the next time give the better object. At first it may be a little difficult, but if he keeps on trying like this, he will eventually get to the point of giving both the old and the new in order to help others. He may then not have a watch, but he will have Christ in his heart and will hear the sweet beat of his heart rejoicing with divine joy. If they take away your coat and you also give away your shirt, then you will be clothed by Christ. If you feel sorry for some unfortunate soul and help him, think if he were Christ himself, what sacrifice would you make? This is how we can be put to the test. The person of faith sees Christ in the person next to him. Christ himself has said, Whatever you did to one of the least of my brethren, you did it to me. The honor, of course, is given to each person accordingly, but the love is the same for all. In his heart, both the highest-ranking official and the poor man hold the same place, the general and the soldier. Yet under why is it that sometimes the person receiving help behaves badly toward his benefactor. The devil goads that person to behave badly so that we may become indignant and lose the benefit of our kindness. It is not his fault. The devil goads him to make us lose everything. When you do a kindness, always feel that you have simply done your duty and be prepared to face temptation so that you may not lose but gain all the good that you may have done. Someone, for example, offers charity and has no intention of revealing it. Then temptation comes into it and makes others say to him, you avaricious person, you have done nothing and so on, while so-and-so has done this and that. This may force him to say humbly, well, I too have done something small, a hospital. Or he may, he may become indignant and be forced to say, who, me? I, who have done this and that? Either way, he loses the spiritual benefit. Or the devil may provoke the recipient of the charity to tell his benefactor, you are ungrateful, an exploiter, and so forth, until he finally and patiently responds, I'm the exploiter, I who offered you this and that charity, and am your benefactor. Not stopping there, he'll go on. What an ungrateful person he is. I didn't even care if he said a thank you, but he should at least acknowledge my kindness. But when one expects an acknowledgement, well then, there goes the spiritual benefit, and everything is lost. Whereas if the benefactor holds on to good thoughts and says, it's better that he's forgotten the kindness I did to him, or perhaps he was upset or tired to speak like that, he excuses the bad behavior and does not lose the spiritual benefit. When we do not expect repayment of any kind for our kindness, then our spiritual reward remains pure. Christ did everything for us 
and we crucified him. What is it that we say in our hymns? Instead of the manna I offered them, they gave me gall to drink. Let us always try to do good without expecting anything in return. He who gives receives divine joy. Two joys exist for man. One is the joy of receiving, and the other is the joy of giving. The special joy one feels when giving cannot be compared with the joy one feels when receiving. If man is to understand whether or not he is making spiritual progress, he must first look within himself to see if he rejoices when he gives and not when he receives. If he's upset when receiving and joyful when giving. Then again, if he's working properly spiritually, he will rarely ever remember the good he has done, but will never forget even the smallest good done to him. He can never ignore the smallest benefaction of others. He may have given an entire vineyard to someone and forgotten about it, but if the other person gives him just one bunch of grapes from that same vineyard, he will never forget it. Or he may have given someone many valuable carved wooden icons and forgotten about it. But if the receiver later reciprocates by giving him a small icon made of plastic, he is moved by the gesture, even though it is of such insignificant value. And out of gratitude, he's already thinking how to repay the favor. He could give away even an entire chapel along with the plot of land and still put it out of his mind. In other words, the correct spiritual approach is to forget the good you do to others and to remember the good others do to you. When someone reaches this state of spiritual being, then he is indeed human, a man of God. But on the other hand, if someone constantly forgets the good done to him by others and only remembers the good he has done to others, this work is contrary to what Christ seeks from us. But even if one thinks, you gave me so much and I gave you that much, this too is an unacceptable mentality, grocer-like. I try to give to the person who has the greatest need. I don't reckon things according to a bargaining mentality. He gave me these books and now I owe him the same amount which I must pay in order to be even. Or if others don't give to me, I won't give them anything either. This too is nothing more than a human form of justice. He who receives experiences human joy but he who gives experiences divine joy. Divine joy comes to us by giving. Someone, for example, gives me a book. He now rejoices spiritually, divinely, and I who receive the book rejoice humanly. When I too give the book, I too will rejoice divinely, while the other person who receives it will rejoice humanly. But if he too goes on to give it, then he too will rejoice divinely, and so on. Do you see how with one thing alone many people can rejoice both humanly and divinely? One must learn to rejoice by giving. When he rejoices by giving, he is properly placed and is networked, networking with Christ. He has divine grace. When he gives or offers something, the joy he feels provides him with divine oxygen. When someone rejoices, when he receives or when others are sacrificing themselves for him, this type of joy is, is full of it and this asphyxiating stench. The people who offer themselves unconditionally without any consideration for themselves will be the ones who will judge us in the future. What wonderful joy these people experience. These are the people Jesus Christ protects. But most people, unfortunately, are only happy when they receive things. So they deprive themselves of any divine joy and remain tormented. Christ is moved when we love our neighbor more than ourselves, and he fills us with divine gladness. You see, he did not restrict himself to you shall love your neighbor as yourself, but went on to sacrifice himself for mankind. The greedy gather for others to find. Yet under there are Two little brothers, the younger one gives, but the older one doesn't. The parents must teach the older child how sweet it is to give. If the older boy works on this, he'll become better and will have an even greater reward than the younger one who's giving by nature. Yet under how can someone get rid of having a closed heart, of his difficulty in giving? 
Why? Are you stingy? I'll throw you out. Even with your obedience, for example, if you are in charge of hospitality, go receive a general blessing to be able to give. Don't you see how God himself is so generous in giving his blessings to all? If someone does not become used to giving, he becomes used to stinginess, and then he has a difficulty in giving. The greedy person becomes a kind of piggy bank, gathering for others to find. But he loses the joy of giving and of divine reward. Once I told a rich man, why do you hoard your money? You have no obligations. What will you do with the money? When I die, it will all remain here, he told me. But I told him, I give you a blessing to take it all up there. It will all remain here, he said again. Let others take it when I am dead. Of course the money will all stay here, I said to him. But the point is for you to give it away with your own hands while you're still alive. There is no more foolish person than the greedy one who constantly amasses money and lives in deprivation only to finally buy his way into hell with his hoarded money. He has lost it all because he doesn't give and loses himself with material things. Then he loses Jesus Christ. The miserly person becomes the laughing stock of others. There was once a rich landowner. He owned many fields in the country and apartments in Athens, but was very stingy. Once he prepared a large pot of bean soup for his workers in the fields, but it was very watery. In the past, field laborers worked from sunrise to sunset. At noon, when they stopped working to rest a little, the rich man poured the soup into a large pan and the workers gathered around to have lunch. Sometimes they caught a bean in their spoon and sometimes only some broth. One of the workers, who was a teaser, put down his spoon, stepped to the side, removed his shoes and socks, and pretended to climb into the soup pan. Hey, what are you doing? The others told him. I was thinking of climbing into the pan to try and catch a bean, he told them with a smile. That's how stingy the, the la that landowner was. For this reason, it is a thousand times better for one to be wasteful than miserly. Stinginess is an illness, Yerunda, a very grave illness. If stinginess takes hold of a person, there is no greater illness. It is good to be thrifty, but one must be careful not to be gradually overcome by the spirit of stinginess. Yet under some people are so stingy, they'll even deprive themselves of food. Only food, there was a rich merchant with a large variety store who used to slice flat matches into three parts so he wouldn't waste them. A very rich woman had a sulfur candle. By maintaining burning coals, she used the sulfur candle to light the fire so that she would not have to use a match. And she had houses, fields, and so much property. I'm not saying that people should be wasteful, but at least an extravagant person will more readily give you something if you ask for it. If someone is mean, he will be too stingy to give it up. Once there were two housewives in the neighborhood discussing salads and vinegars. One of them said, I have very good vinegar. One day the other poor woman needed some vinegar and went to ask her neighbor for some. Look here, the other said, if I were to be giving it away, I would not now have this vinegar of seven years. It is good to be thrifty, but also to share whatever we may have with those in need. Being thrifty does not mean being miserly. My father didn't hold on to any money. In Farasa, there was no hotel, but our home was like the town hotel. Whoever came to town would go to the president's house to stay. There he would be given food, someone would wash his feet, he'd be given clean socks to wear. Now I see that even in some shrines they have storage rooms filled with donated vigil lamps, and, and they won't say, we have plenty, don't give us any more. The ones they have certainly cannot be used or sold, and still they don't give them away. When someone begins to gather stuff, he becomes so tied up with his possessions that he is unable to give them away. But if someone stops gathering stuff and starts giving them away, then his heart will gather itself around Christ without even realizing it. It is not right for a widow not to have money. 
to buy a yard of material to clothe her children while I'm hoarding my money and my goods. How can I tolerate this? In my hut, I do not have dishes, nor pots and pans. I have some little tin cans. I prefer to give away 500 drachmas to some student to help him go from one monastery to the next than to buy something for myself. If you do not gather, you have a blessing from God. When you give a blessing, you also receive a blessing. One blessing leads to another. Goodwill is everything. Yananda, what about when someone asks for help and I have nothing to give? When I wish to give charity and I have nothing to give, then I do charity with blood. Someone who has wealth and gives material help experiences some joy, while another who has nothing to give suffers constantly and is humbled, saying, I have not given any alms. Goodwill is everything. A rich man has the ability to give and does not give. A poor man wants to give but does not give because he doesn't have anything to give. The one case is different from the other. If a rich man gives, he will experience a certain degree of joy. The poor man suffers. He wants to give alms, some alms, but has nothing to give, and so suffers inside, whereas if he had something to give, he would give it and not suffer. Goodwill shows in our actions. If someone asks alms from a poor person, and this poor person, even though deprived, offers something, regardless of whether the other person goes out and drinks ouzo with the money given, then the poor man who gave will have spiritual joy, and God will guide someone else to provide him with material help. Do you know what great injustice is done sometimes? One person gives all he has in order to help, and the recipient rationalizes the gesture to his liking. Yet, yeah, what do you mean? Suppose that someone has just 5,000 drachmas in his pocket. On his way, he meets a beggar and places all the drachmas in the beggar's hand and leaves. The beggar then sees that he has just received 5,000 drachmas and is very happy. At that same time, another very rich person passes by and seeing that the other one gave 5,000 drachmas to the beggar, he reasons to himself, for him to be giving 5,000 drachmas at a time, one can only wonder how much money he must have. Certainly he must have millions. So the very rich man gives 500 drachmas to the beggar and eases his conscience with the thought that he has done his duty. In fact, the first man only had the 5,000 drachmas. And seeing the beggar, his heart was moved by compassion to give him all his money. If the rich man had also worked spiritually, he would have had the good thought to reason accordingly. Oh my goodness, he gave the beggar everything he had. Or maybe he would have said he had 10,000 and gave the 5,000 drachmas to the beggar. But how can he have any good thoughts about the, this matter when he does not work at all in a spiritual manner? He simply reasons and says, for him to be throwing his money away like that, he must be raking it in. Some people, again, while giving 500 or even 1,000 drachmas to a poor person, will start bargaining over 5 or 10 drachmas with the poor laborer who works for him. I can't understand this. You give 500 or even 1,000 drachmas to a stranger, and the person you have beside you who helps you, you allow to go hungry. This is the person you are obligated to love and help first. But it seems the charity offered by such people is only done to earn praise from others. They will even take someone to court over a thousand drachmas simply because they're thinking in a worldly way and do not wish to be taken for a dupe. A devout woman related an incident to me. This was in 1958. She wanted to buy a load of firewood from an old lady who had traveled three hours to bring it from the forest to town. In fact, that particular time, it had taken her three and a half hours because she had to circle around the lookout post to avoid the forest patrol. How much is the wood, the woman asked. Fifteen drachmas, the old lady replied. No, it's too much. I'll give you eleven drachmas for it. So then went on to tell me, she went on to tell me, I, I bargained with her like this so that people will not take us spiritual people for fools. After that, I gave her a piece of my mind, 
a thorough dressing down. That poor old lady had two animals and had spent two days gathering the wood in order to make 22 drachmas. Instead of offering an extra 20 drachmas for the wood, the greedy woman tried to bargain the price down for just a few drachmas. Giving alms in secret. Yet under, some people consider it to be Phariseeism when someone goes to church but is devoid of love and sacrifice. But how do they know this? Are they certain of this? That is how they see it. What did Christ say? Did he say you should judge? Somebody may not give to a gypsy because he intends to help some other sick person who is in great need. The gypsy will receive something from another passerby, but the sick person may not. How then can they jump to conclusions without knowing? Phariseeism is the practice of some people who do their good works in the open so that other people can praise them. I remember when I was at the Idiorhythmic Monastery in 1957, footnote, Idiorhythmic versus Synobitic, Idiorhythmic Monastery where the monks live together without a common abbot, but who follow an individual program in their own spiritual and communal life. To continue, they provided a certain blessing, a kind of gratuity, depending on the difficulty of each obedience with which each monk had undertaken, because in those days there were shortages of manpower in the monasteries. There were some fathers who had the strength to assume several obediences, for which they received additional blessings, but would then give them away. There was a monk who was called Spangos, for stingy, because he was tight and was not known to give. When he died, many poor people gathered at his funeral from Halkiriki, Megalipanagia, and many other spots. They were mourning for him. These people had oxen to transport their lumber, which was then transported by oxen, unlike today when we use big three-axle trucks. Now, what had that monk done? He had saved all the money provided to him for the obediences he had undertaken, and whenever he had found a family who only had one ox or whose ox had died, he would give them the money to buy one. It was a big thing, then, to be able to buy an ox. They cost about 5,000 drachmas, which was a lot in those days. The other fathers would openly give five drachmas to some poor person, ten to another, even twenty drachmas to still another. But this monk, he did everything in secret, and no one knew what he was doing. He saved the money and gave it away in large sums to the needy families. Everybody called him stingy because they thought he was tight with his money. Finally, when he died, the poor people who he had helped came to his funeral to mourn him, saying, He saved us. He saved us. In those days, if someone had an ox, he could transport lumber and provide for his family. The fathers were amazed by their fellow monk who did his charity in secret. That's why I say, how can you possibly know what is going on in the heart and mind of other people? Yet under what is wrong when someone gives alms but feels empty inside? He should reflect whether he is acting out of a need to be liked by others. When the motives for almsgiving are pure, then we feel joy. Do you know what they did in some town once? This was told to me by a devout attorney I knew. Christmas was approaching, and a few Christians decided to gather various things, bundle them into packages, and take them to the public square to distribute them to the poor. It was after the German occupation when people were in dire need. The attorney advised them, <clears throat> since we know who the poor families are, it'd be better if we distributed the packages quietly to each family directly. No, they said, we must distribute the packages in the public square for the glory of God so people can see that we care for the poor. But this is not right, he told them again. Where is it written that charity should be given like this? The group, they wanted their way for, for the glory of God. The devout attorney could not change their minds and left them to it. They gathered the packages in the town's main square and announced that the packages would be distributed there. Certain greedy, rough, and uncouth characters came quickly and gathered up the packages for themselves, even though they had no need, while the poor remained empty-handed. 
When the donors tried to intervene, they were handed roughly by the shady characters for the glory of God. You see how the spiritual laws work? A secular person can be proud and publicly announce his plans, but how can this ever be justified for spiritual people? Yet are there people who do not believe, but who are still kind and do charitable work? When a worldly person gives out of a pure disposition and not out of a need to be liked by others, then God will not ignore him, but will find a way to speak to his heart. Someone I know who lived in Switzerland told me of the following incident. A rich atheist woman was so kind and compassionate that she distributed all of her property to the poor and suffering and ended up becoming very poor herself. Then the people who she had helped saw to it that she was placed in the best nursing home. In spite of all her charity, she remained an atheist. When people tried to speak to her about Christ, she refused to discuss the matter. She insisted that Christ was nothing more than a good man, a social worker, and other similar theories. Perhaps even the Christians she happened to meet or know did not help her to be moved by their life. My friend asked me to pray for the soul of that woman. In any case, my friend also prayed fervently for that woman to find her faith in God. After a considerable time had passed, my friend informed me what had finally happened. One day when I went to visit her in the nursing home, I found her completely changed. I believe, I believe, she cried out joyfully. Some event had occurred in her life that had changed her. Later, she asked, to be baptized. In so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head. Romans 12.20 Yet under when someone is not needy but pretends to be, should we help him? Christ said, we should give to him who begs from us without examining. Even if someone who begs from you is not in need, you should still give to him. Be happy in giving to him. God himself maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. So why should we not help our neighbor? Are we worthy of all the gifts granted to us by God? God does not deal with us according to our sins, nor reward us according to our iniquities. Is some poor person asking you for help? Even if you doubt his situation, you should still help him discreetly, so that you are not tempted by negative thoughts. Do you know what Abba Isaac says? If someone on horseback should stretch out his hand and ask alms of you, do not refuse him, for at that moment he is certainly in need. St. Isaac, ascetical homily number four. You never know what state he may be in. You should believe what the other person tells you and give as you are asked. If we have, for example, only 1,000 drachmas and we give them to a poor person and are troubled for not having more to give, then in addition to the blessing, the money given, we also place Christ and a good restlessness into his conscience. This action of ours will trouble him because he will constantly be thinking about the merciful person who, together with the 1,000 drachmas, also gave him his compassionate heart. This may force him to return anonymously the money exacted or even more. Something similar has happened to me. Once when I was in Thessaloniki, a woman stopped me. She appeared to be a gypsy and asked for money for her children because her husband was sick. I only had a 500 drachma note and I gave it to her. Please forgive me, I told her, but I do not have any more to give you. If you like, take my address and write to me how your husband is doing and I will try to send you some more money from the holy mountain. After a short time, I received a letter containing 500 drachmas in the following note. Thank you for your kindness. I am returning the money you gave me. When someone gives alms with a truly compassionate heart, the beggar is touched by the authentic love, by Christ, and will himself begin to, to give rather than to gather. But even if the beggar is very hard-hearted and continues to gather, he himself will not enjoy what he has gathered. For God will ensure the money finds its rightful place, and the beggar will be left with only the weariness and the trouble of the collection, let us call it that, which he took for others. Yet unto how much then should someone give? 
Someone should give as much as will not trouble his conscience. Discernment is important. He should not give 100 and then be sorry that he did not give 50. Much attention is needed when someone has love with a lot of enthusiasm. It is then good to be a little conservative with his love and enthusiasm so that he will not regret having given too much to an unfortunate person when less could have been given and thus be left empty-handed himself. Gradually he can acquire experience and give according to the self-renunciation he has. Yet under if someone asks for unreasonable things, should we give in? In that case, one needs discernment and even more discernment. If someone asks you for things just to have and admire them, let him have them. You see, Jesus Christ did not say to Judas, What kind of an apostle are you? Get rid of your avarice. Instead, he made him treasurer. But if we, for example, someone asks you to give him a tin of marmalade, which you have, and you know that he has a whole case of it when another person has none and needs some, then tell the person who has and is asking for more, Brother, if you like, why don't you also give a little too so, to so-and-so who has none? If there is no one who is in need, then give it without telling him anything, since he has asked you for it. Perhaps this offering, if there is a cord of sensitivity in the recipient, will move him to correct himself. In these cases, we apply what St. Paul said. When your enemy harms you and you in turn do him good, you place burning coals upon his head. Romans 12.20, Proverbs 25.21. This does not mean that you actually burn him, but when you do good to him, then the love which is Christ begins to work in him and divine grace is activated. Then the man can be transformed because his conscience bothers him. That is, he's burnt by his conscience. But it is not right to do good for the purpose of censuring another and forcing him to be prudent, for this weakens the good one. Good should be done with love. When you avenge the wrong with kindness and goodness, then the person can be changed in the good sense and be corrected. In Konitsa there was a drunkard who had a family, and I used to give him something. Some people had learned that I was helping him because he himself would tell them, and they told me, don't give to him, he drinks. But he would tell me, give me something for my children, and when giving I would say to him, take this for your children. I knew that he drank, but I also knew that this word would also help a little. He would drink, but he would also think of his children a little. If I had not given him anything, he would have tormented his wife and taken the money she'd earned by working as a cleaning lady to drink and cause even greater suffering to his children. But when I told him, take this for your children, he did remember his children a little. You see, I felt pain for him and for his family, and this was obvious to him and was active in his inner being. Many have been helped in this manner. Some, because their conscience troubled them, would send the money back. By reasoning, we do not allow Christ to do his work. It is time to learn the true gospel, to be truly evangelical persons, not Protestants.